It is very you know what's different. really sad, Monty? I've heard there's even some TSM <laughs> fans didn't put their entire life savers into FTX. I mean, come on, guys. You're not even going to support the team. Come on. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Four Horsemen. If anything, this is sort of a sequel to the episode that we did, I think, in December or January with Tommy, a.k.a. Lurpus, that was about the business state of the industry, in which many of the things that we are now seeing were indeed foreshadowed. A scant four months later and everything that perhaps we were concerned about is coming to pass and more. And by the way, guys. This is just the beginning. I know you were very excited. Maybe you thought that it would only be TSM and CLG that were going down the tubes. But in fact, it's probably going to be a lot more than that by the time the dust settles and we get through this. However, I at least am, as usual, perhaps the most optimistic on this show that we are going to get through this into a different place where we can actually be sustainable. The bubble bursting might have some positive side effects. But as I've said before, before we get started, you know, the esports winter is very cold, right? And that's why our sponsor Freezepipe has perfect synergy with esports winter because it will cool your smoke by over 300 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a glycerin chamber from their Bong XL. Pop it in the freezer for an hour, and you too can get a chilled, you know, non-scorching experience, which you should want coming up on 420. That is in six days, guys, as of the time we're, we're, uh, we're doing this show and recording it. So you probably should accelerate your purchases. And as a reminder... This is a separate advertisement for our own content. As part of 420, Thorne and I will be in two days recording us using our products and then watching cringe esports content, which will be released on April 20th. So in our Discord channel for Last Free Nation, you can, of course, find the 420 content submissions or reply to the Twitter thread from Last Free Nation. If you have cringe content you want us to watch, I will be developing a playlist. So thank you to The Freeze Pipe for sponsoring us. Go to thefreezepipe.com and use your code LFN for Last Free Nation at checkout for 10% off your entire order. We'll be in most of that cringe content, won't we? So it's, uh, we're just watching our own Look, podcast. It's gonna be, it's it? gonna be funny. People, people have already submitted a bunch of good stuff that I had forgotten about. Um, so it'll be it'll be a ride, guys. It'll be a ride. It'll be a fun time. Much more fun than discussing, um, you know, a lot of the topics that we're going to discuss on this show. So clearly this was triggered by the fact that we have CLG selling, which I think is a good thing. Well, by the way, just so we can make selling. it clear, like we haven't actually introduced the guest that he was actually like involved oh, right. with CLG. Uh, well, it's, 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 a, it's a, OK, this is a classic, yes. uh, this is a classic on our network. Don't introduce the guest or allow them to talk for an extended no, period of time. <laughs> so the, our guest this for this episode is Devin Nash, who used to be the CEO of CLG. Um, so th we did not actually during the good overlap. days, I will say, during the good during period the good of time, like, yeah, you, you were responsible it was for like the last 2015, years. Yeah. 2016, yes. right? Exactly. Devin, I got out when the going's good, exactly. <laughs> Basically, the best time to leave CLG. Like, so, how much, of, how much of that MSG money did you get? A lot. Great. Oh, I'm happy for yeah. you. I'm happy for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a, a substantial amount. Yeah. Um, I mean, I saw the writing on the wall. I'm sure we'll get into it. And, and I mean, I, even in my announcement, I said, like, I'm not following a company with this going this direction. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but I'm honored to be here. Seriously. Uh, the, 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 thank you, guys. I, I see you guys as literally the esports legends. So for me to be here on this podcast is like fucking crazy. Can I curse well, on this you, podcast? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, great. Yeah. Oh, we're so <laughs> sad. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm just the word cunt. There we know. Now we know where we're at. So there's the boundaries. <laughs> Stay within that. You'll be okay. It's, 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 we hate our, our, our videos Collins. being actually monetized. So yeah, exactly. eventually... Those words are going to be dropped. And then the then what YouTube does, it will scan this video for that word and then it will demonetize it. Yeah, it's a <laughs> yeah. great, it's a great system we have here. You know, when they actually system. did introduce that for real, though, Monty, that was the one of the only moments I was like, ah, that sort of bit me in the ass, hasn't it? Because I'd have been on everyone's stream and Twitch channel and YouTube channel saying the word cunt about a million times before <laughs> that. And as you say, they obviously apply it retroactively. So it's like, it's, not even, it's like at that point, there's not even any point contacting them. Like, yeah, I've sort of fucked you over there. It's just 
It's over for, it's over for everyone. You can't shit the whole yep. internet down, can you? Oh. I promise you this video is now demonetized. By the way. I, I, knows, I'm so glad that AI has gotten to the point that it can parse through Thorne's fucking accent to, to actually tell that he's cursing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the, I, I, you know what? I, I also don't understand because you would think that it wouldn't demonetize it for Australians. You know what I mean? It, you know, <laughs> apparently, it's just a global phenomenon. The, the, the yeah. Irish as well. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> once again, they impregnate prejudice towards the irish it's a disgrace um so anyway this is all to say that uh we will be talking about the the clg and i say sale in quotes because it as far as we can tell from the publicly available information so andy miller in his video implied that it may not have been an actual sale but the fact that madison square garden now had a large equity stake within NRG. So it seems like he didn't buy the slots. He was giving MSG equity in return for the League of Legends slots, which is also makes the most sense as to why he doesn't want the branding, why he doesn't want any of CLG's other divisions. It was purely a trade of the the franchise slot for the equity within his own company. And so this is really not a sale. It is a consolidation which I think is what you're going to start seeing with a lot of these other teams right now. And we can kind of talk through, you know, some of the other teams that at least in League of Legends have been for sale or are up for sale right now. TSM, it seems like maybe potentially for sale to the right buyer. Dignitas is for sale. Um, Immortals is for sale. So these organizations have been out there actively courting buyers. And of course, by the way, guys, for all of you out there who are saying like, Oh, yeah, you know, Mr. Beast is going to buy one of these teams. All of these teams have already talked to Mr. Beast. I have confirmed that. <laughs> I don't think he's going to buy a team, guys. I don't I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but they already, as soon as they had a just a whiff of Mr. Beast, all of the teams that were for sale were like, hey, Mr. Beast, you want to buy our slot? So that's already happened. If, it, if it's not happening right now, I don't think it's going to. Uh, so the desperation for influencer sales is real. We have seen FlyQuest uh, change hands from... Two between two traditional sports teams owners, the Edens family who owned the Milwaukee Bucks to um, the family that now owns the Florida Panthers hockey team. So there has been some changeover in terms of actual sales, so not consolidations or, you know, equity swaps. And um, yeah, so that's where we're at. A lot of the endemic esports teams are kind of hunkering down right now. You see teams like Cloud9 and Team Liquid, I think, not interested in selling their spots, but I think they probably will be interested in terms of making themselves a more sustainable business. Um, and what's happening is, to explain what's going on right now, it it has been several things happening simultaneously. So one of the bad factors has been that viewership, obviously, on the LCS has been going down. It peaked during the pandemic in 2020, where they did about 30 million, I believe, viewed hours in the in the summer of 2020. And we're down to about 14 million viewed hours now uh, this spring in total across the entire split. So those numbers went up a little bit from 2017. But as we know, in 2015 and 2016, which is probably the peak of the, the LCS viewership, we were seeing, you know, it matches that we're getting between maybe, you know, 400,000 for a quality TSM versus CLG match. Um, we used to see those numbers on Twitch. I would say the numbers right now are probably more reminiscent of 2013. So this has probably been the lowest since kind of like, you know, 2013, the start of LCS. In yeah. fact, just today on the League of Legends subreddit, there was a time capsule that said that the concurrent viewership of the LCS 10 years ago was between 110 and like 120,000 viewers, I believe, which is about where we're at right now, at least in terms of this spring, in terms of average concurrency. So it's not that, you know, these factors have gone down to all time lows. It's just that the peak happened along, you know, several years ago and was kind of helped out by the pandemic and it's been cratering pretty hard since then. Just think about what that means though, Monty. That means it was all for nothing. People spent all those millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and imported a million people just so at the end we have the same viewership at the beginning. Like, what? it was just for nothing. 
It was all for right. nothing. What was the point? Got, the joke I've is we, you all had an arms race against each other, bankrupting each other well, and and all yeah. your investors, and then had the gall to turn around and go, this well, thing isn't working, is it? It's like, yeah, because of you. Because of you. Think, all of you people who did all that for nothing at the end. Of, no, I, remember, the only revenue source in esports is sponsorship via fucking viewership. And so the one factor that should be the variable that defines the whole industry, you just ignored that one variable. Bro, and we're six yeah. minutes in and Thor is going ape shit. I love it. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. All right, all right, all right. It's all good. So yeah, wind it back. Wind it back in. We have to talk about several different things that have been happening as the kind of precursors to why we got here. Um, one of them, so at, we're talking. I started talking about viewership because this is important. Because what happened when the venture capital came in was that these people were sold a dream of increasing viewership. And if you see the early days of League of Legends, so for example, when I was running tournaments out of my Brooklyn apartment in 2011 and 2012, I was getting 50,000 concurrent viewers and TSM and CLG were playing in these tournaments, okay? So the rocket, you could see this rocket taking off with these streaming web service, like the streaming video services um, that made esports, live esports accessible easily to people in a way that it hadn't been before uh, at, at any point in time. So that was, it was really just activating the player bases, the interested player bases of, of those, those games. Then we saw this kind of rise, especially in the LCS up to, you know, 20, you know, 2013, it was getting hundred thousand by 2015. We were seeing like, you know, 400,000, 500,000 concurrence in, in North American league of legends. Then it kind of tapered off from that point forward. But at the same time, we actually did have According to Riot, the largest viewership for Worlds ever last year. So on an international mm. level, it's, it's not that it. League of Legends is doing badly. It's it's really the LCS because LEC has obviously grown significantly since their rebrand, since they've kind of, you know, done their own thing and made their own product. And China and Korea are clearly going quite well. So there's there's kind of several factors here. The The North American teams that were fueled by venture capital on this dream that the exponential growth was just going to continue, that we were going to go from 50,000 concurrence in 2011 to 100,000 in 2013 to 500,000 in 2015, and that that was going to go up into millions, right? And so when we see these teams taking on money and spending it like drunken sailors, uh, this is the assumption that they were making. And they were being pressured by the venture capital funds because venture capital is all about growth. They don't want to see you having a three-year runway. Well, they do now, but they didn't back in the day. What they wanted was, here's a bunch of money. We want you to spend this to grow as aggressively as possible. We want you to not have this money in a year, and then we'll give you more money and we'll buy more of your company. So now that we're in a point where people actually want sustainability, because the next part of this conversation after we finish with this is going to be about the ad the ad uh, market right now which is also in a really horrible state there's also the public perception of esports especially with phases stock price that is completely crushing the industry as well which is another conversation so let's start with the kind of i think the the starting point here has to be the investment that came in, the expectations around growth, especially in North America, and where we are right now. I mean, the thing, Devin, you were obviously literally involved, as we previously mentioned, yeah. with the team that sold to the venture capital people. And in the time period you all talk about was really sort of the, one, the first or second wave, right? We were in all the pitches, yeah. Uh, it's kind of crazy, too, because we were in the pitches for OWL, CDL, and everything. And it, what Monty said is 100% right. And I'll add to it that there was a lot of, like, really esoteric language around, like, stuff like, you guys are going to make millions of dollars off ticket sales. We're going to fill stadiums with kids that are going to watch this stuff, and it's going to fix your aging demographic of, of sports yep. people that don't want to watch that traditional shit anymore and now they want to watch this stuff mm. like that was like real pitches like i remember sitting in a meeting with bobby kodak and there's like and he's just throwing slides up that are like this is going to make ticket sales of like tens of millions of dollars and vcs are like oh my you know, like, they're, 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 like I, I think that the major sports teams that acquired LCS franchises were the were genuinely believing for a time that that this was the answer to the age out demographic problem of traditional sports. Yes. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and, mm-hmm. and just to give a bit of insight into that as well, Devin, you know, coming at it from the opposite side of the table, you know, when I was working at Turner Sports, exact same thing, right? Mm-hmm. They saw it as a solution to stick and ball sports as this age of demographic, but also everyone's cutting cable, you know, like how yeah. do we how do we create a product that's down with the kids that they will engage with for a lifetime? And they were super naive, you know, like in, in terms of, Video like a game doesn't last more than ten years typically. CS is Counter Strike's like a very unique value proposition. Yeah. League of Legends is a unique or value Brood War in Korea. Yeah, example. Brood yeah. War. In Korea. Like, there's, these there's are all these are all outliers. If you think about every video game that's ever been made, mm-hmm. even the ones that have a competitive mm-hmm. angle to them, um, and so I don't think they realized going in. And if you look at where the E League brand is now, it's been folded into Bleacher Report. Yeah. Um, and, and it's essentially become part of the aging, dying media that it was meant to, you know, replace. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I've absolutely. had a, I've had the like the luck of being on both sides of the equation now because, I, as Monty asked, I, I did do well enough to get into VC, so I've been doing a lot of VC. And and there's VC has this weird like bubble system where they will look at a particular property and they'll be like, that's the thing we need to invest in. So it was crypto bros. And then now it's AI. Right. And, be- and for a time AI, yes. that was esports <laughs> underlined. Right. And everybody was just like, well, we got to have an esports team. Like that's it. And so like, like uh, what's crazy is the, there was one side of like venture capital that was expecting these like five X, 10 X returns on esports in three to five years, which we all know was impossible. There's a whole nother side of it. That's like Madison square garden, right? The 76ers, all these guys that are kind of looking, to legitimately replace everything to Richard Lewis's point, right? And, and neither of them came to fruition. <laughs> neither, neither of them became true. <laughs> yeah. And, and look, just to add on to this, because, uh, you know, the reason Devin's like a, a, a good guest to have on it, I actually think it's your experience now, you know, kind of working at an agency that's almost more relevant to the conversation we're happening mm. we're having now, because all of these esports organizations essentially became de facto agencies, whether they want to acknowledge that or not. And indeed, with the yeah. Tfue case with FaZe, which you and I both f- thought, if it had gone to completion, would have changed the esports landscape forever. Forever. We yeah. were praying for it, too. Yeah, because but it, it cost Tfue too much place. money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and they settled, you know. Um, yeah, I ran into Tfue in Vegas, and he was like, dude, um, this is costing me so much, I got to get the fuck out. <laughs> Yeah. Like, they, they, they were going to call me as an expert witness in the case. I, was sh- also, I know that. They should have. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I would have loved that. your dream? Like, like, whose music is that? Richard yeah. Lewis? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, let me tell you why FaZe sucks. I know, exactly. Honor. Ooh, would have been delicious, wouldn't it? But yeah, they, they settled. Um, but yeah, it's like, obviously, they're all de facto agencies now. And what, what agencies are realizing increasingly is, and, and Devin, you had some really good stats about this in your video, the mm. return of investment on esports it's never been there and Mm -hmm. the promises that have been made are now like there's no more lies to tell there's no more stats to invent which is great there's no more inflation you can do yeah yeah and it's it's great in a way it it, it, it is and it isn't there's a so there's a concept called ROAS, which for people that are watching is called return on advertising spend. And when you look at return on advertising spend, so so what I do really short because it's relevant to this conversation is I represent brands. I don't I don't run a talent agency. I represent brands and I do creative campaigns to help them run awesome campaigns across YouTube, Instagram, places like that. So I talk to brands directly and I, I control their advertising budget and then I run that against different stuff that we think is cool. And I, so I, I see esports from one angle, which was like I was a team owner trying to sell brands this and the and now I'm actually an agency that has the brand's budget and now I'm like looking at esports teams to sell it to. It's a really weird dynamic and Richard Lewis is 100% correct, right? Because because what, what's happened is these esports teams and, and I think to some extent, Twitch talent agencies as well have this problem of like, okay, who do you really work for? Like, are, if you work for the creators and you work for the talent, well, then you should be trying to get them the best deals. But we know in esports, there's a huge problem with that where they basically sign these kids to exclusive contracts, make them represent the brands and don't pay them a cent of those sponsorships, right? And they can't because they're not making any money. They, the little money they can make from the sponsorships, they got to take. But Or are you working for the brand, the person you claim you're going to get like great results for, you're going to get tons of returns for? There's a, there's a weird uh, relationship there that doesn't make sense. And, and so there's also a lot of questions, I think, uh, that the Tfue case would have revealed had it come to fruition was like, are these like are these kids are they talent 
Are they contractors? Yeah, so. Are they employees? Like, what are the implications of that? We've never had those questions answered. Um, I had a situation at CLG where a part of my CSGO team just walked off contract. And really, we couldn't do shit. Not really. Because, like, at the end of the day, there isn't really anything like there is, like, the TAA in California that's going to, like, hold them to it. And I think the only thing stopping esports players from doing stuff like that and going to another team or whatever is they just don't know they can. Yes. Mm -hmm. By the way, one thing I'll just throw in here, because I feel like if someone's a casual fan, this is a key piece of information to understand, is you'll see a lot of people approach esports business. I used to make the same mistake myself before I knew people like Lopez, and I could actually ask like experts in the financial fields who have real world experience. I used to also think of business, like how I, an individual, might do it. Like, right, you've got to have enough money to get through this month, and then when you spend, you've got to make it a smart decision. And what I didn't know, and a lot of you casual fans will be in the same boat, is the people who own these teams, so like Jack from Cloud9 as an example, he isn't spending either A, Cloud9's money or his own money when he buys an Overwatch League slot or an LCS slot. In fact, that's the key thing to understand because that's why you'll understand why these people can, in a way, sell a false bill of goods without necessarily thinking the devil will one day come to collect their soul, as it were. <laughs> because what they do is this. I once remembered asking right around the time Overwatch League was going to launch and all the people in this chat were insiders. We all knew loads of the people who were interested, who was like, Bid it, and I was talking to a bunch of the LCS owners, and people might know a lot of those people actually didn't get Overwatch League slot. And I remember saying to someone, like, but how are you going to decide which you want to be in? Like, do you want to be in League? Do you want to be in Overwatch? And they said, Oh, wait, that was never the decision. They said, You understand, like, this what you do with each one of these league slots is you go to your investment group, you say, Right, I've got a chance to get this league slot, it costs this much. Here's in this case for, for Overwatch League, you give them the Morgan Stanley report. You go, here's your projections and what they say they were gonna do, and then essentially they sign off on it, they green light it, they give you the money, you get the spot, otherwise you don't do that he choose not to and basically they told me for real I could be in any franchise league I want to I could be in the LCS one or watching at the time there wasn't Call of Duty but people knew there'd be one eventually like they said essentially if I really thought all these leagues like A if I thought the investor was going for it which notice they didn't just say the returns are good and then B I also thought there was like some value to the game they said I could be in every league I could be in 10 leagues at once now if you understand that premise you understand that actually at the end of the day the team owner doesn't have to go well, bloody hell, I've lost all my money. You haven't lost your money. You've lost that guy's money. The real problem is when you go to that investor... Do you have either a second line of bullshit to keep going, or does it, do you do you have a hard conversation, which is what I imagine is going on right now? I imagine there's so, some hard yeah. conversations going on behind the scenes, right? So, uh, from what I understand from talking to a, a broad swath of people in the industry, a lot of the current investment groups are are basically pushing the teams to get to revenue neutral, so they mm -hmm. they just don't want to be losing money right now, yeah. and so that's been the the key thing, and the the the. The thing about venture capital is that often it is an ongoing relationship between the, the the investment target and the investors, which means that it's not just that they give you a one-time payment. They are going to potentially continue to give you more money and purchase more of your company because they want to see it grow and they want to see it be successful. So yeah. that's why they can keep going back to the well to get money for you know, potential franchise slots and everything like that, because the entire goal is to increase the value of the company to a point where it eventually sells for whatever four hundred million dollars, five hundred million dollars, whatever some of these companies are, are are valued at so that, you know, these venture capital funds cash out and get a healthy, you know, a, a 10x 20x 30x return on their initial investment from helping it grow. And it was thought at the time that you know, these permanent franchise slots were extremely valuable because they yeah. provided the, the you know, they provided something that the teams actually owned. It gave them more leverage with the publishers than they had previously. As Devin and I can tell you, Riot's contracts pre-franchising were completely fucking outrageous. Yeah. That's why they were, so steal, yeah. they were able to steal, they were able to steal my team from me because there was a limitation of liability of $25,000 on the slot. So it didn't matter unless I could get that waived in court and I had to go to arbitration so I couldn't even do it in open court. And so unless I could convince the court to waive the, the limitation on liability, I would have been suing them for legal fees and a maximum award of damages of $25,000. So it wasn't worth it, even though I, I most lawyers told me I had a very winnable case against them. You remember how much um, they offered us in those original contracts to to pay our teams compared to the salary? Oh, it was we had like to put up? It, it was like you know twenty five thousand dollars per player per split. 
yeah. then our and our salaries were like at that time like 250 300 400 and now they're like that like that's the i hope we get into that conversation oh my god the esports salaries are so sure. fucking we crazy will talk right about that, that's, yeah. that's yeah. the other thing i mean <laughs> i remember I mean, we, we the talked about original this. jason katz uh, uh, uh lcs slot contracts the yes, very first that's, ones that's, i got i got jason katz by the way those were still <laughs> the contracts all oh, right there. okay yeah uh because i mean those were insane i mean they were like they gave riot the complete like history of your organization oh, yeah. dude, w- dude oh, yeah. when i showed mm-hmm. when when they took away my slot and i showed this to some like high-powered law firms in los angeles um they were they were like why the why the fuck did you sign this? <laughs> but you're always choice. great when yeah, your lawyer says There wasn't, there wasn't a choice. Yeah. No, no, there wasn't a choice because yeah. basically it was like you sign this deal or you don't get the slot. And that's how it was. So yeah. anyway, the point of this is, well, it's all the point of it is always to tell about riots, bullshit and lies. But the real point of this was to say that franchising could compared to these garbage deals that were offered previously was considered a much more secure investment. And also it had, uh, you know, resale value. And in cases like the LEC, where we now see slots going for like $35 million, probably still not worth $35 million, by the way, guys. But, (laughs) you know, honestly, most of these teams probably, you know, have at least increased in value somewhat in the LCS, even though viewership is less than when they were sold. Uh, because honestly, compared compared to other esports like Overwatch League that was up at the $20 million range in certain categories, the $10 million was actually pretty reasonable uh, for the audience that League of Legends had at the time. So for Riot, it was mostly just about picking the franchises and the teams they wanted to work with, not really about it being market value. Like, mm. And you can, you can knock the teams for spending all this money, but honestly having only spending 10 million dollars at that in 2017 when this was done and getting the security as well as the boost to the valuation of their companies because as soon as they own one of these slots the companies were a lot more valuable because there were only 10 slots there's a scarcity right and so you had to have one of these 10 slots so owning one of those made your company much more valuable which was hugely beneficial to the teams and, and yo like we this is a huge decision at CLG right like when we went to Madison Square Garden we legitimately believed i believed at the time that like the LCS had a really long tail and was going to be successful and that those slots were going to make sense and a large reason why a lot of us sought investment was that like CLG pretty much had a guaranteed shoe in just on legacy. So we, but we can't afford it. I, I can't, I can't throw $10 million at a league slot. Right. right. So I got to find a partner. So a big reason why these VCs and these, these sports teams came in in the first, first place is because we had to go to them and say, look, we got no other option rather than to get some money for this and, and do those partnerships. Mm. Uh, can I, can I just spice this up a little bit? Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I feel it's been a very civilized conversation so far and it's, I'm so, I'm so surprised so far. Yeah. I know. I know. It's been like, we're all, we're all in agreement. So let's just knock it up a notch, get the Spice Weasel out. Right. In your video that you made, you know, esports is dying, and you were saying about how sad you were. Which about we'll, I'll it. link below, guys, if you want to yeah. see Devin's video. Um, oh, geez, thanks. It, it's it's like, you know, it's 50 minutes. It's a good listen. Um, <laughs> but 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 here's the thing. Uh the 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 problem I have in sort of the framing of this is we're sort of attributing blame to um, you know, the the almost like the VC groups themselves. Mm-hmm. And I disagree. I I think the people that are crying the most about esports dying are actually the motherfuckers that held the pillow over the face of esports. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the likes of your Jacks, your Reginalds, mm-hmm. your Nade Shots. Those guys are the ones in all of the clips now talking about how it's not economically viable. Because of you, because you were not businessmen, you came in and eventually you finessed sponsors initially, and then you finessed VC groups. And then, as Monty rightly says, you were able to basically buy into a collective lie from Riot Games and Activision Blizzard, which is, hey, let's have these slots. We know they're not worth 10 million. We know they're not worth 20 million, but they will add a false valuation to your company that then you can use to finesse other motherfuckers. And the spend and the inflation of salaries, because these guys don't want to actually build a talent pipeline, wink, wink, lol, evil geniuses. They actually want to just buy the best players and they'll pay anything to have the best players and to be the most winningest team, even though winning actually, in terms of what it does to your finances and what it does to your brand, actually very little, barely moves the dial at all. 
And so essentially for me, the thing that upsets me the most about kind of the, the, the esports dying conversation is I know who fucking killed it. Like they're there, they're still in the room holding the fucking gun, guys. And and they're full of shit. They're full of shit crying so, about it. Oh no, uh, okay. how did so it come I, to this? I, 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 think, right, okay. I think his I think his team owners, right? Um I it, it wasn't a Machiavellian plan by by at least CLG speaking speaking personally that I was like eh, hey, 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 now I was screw all the I was in the same circle jerk as them I really yep. drank the Kool Aid and believed that well, this was look, we have to we have to take yeah. it back in time Devin because the, it wasn't reason so you have to remember that all of this happened at the it, it basically at the beginning of 2017 and it was all yeah. spurred by the fact Riot freaked out Riot was not planning to franchise in 2017 but when Overwatch Watch leak showed up they flipped out and accelerated their own franchising i don't think it would have happened for another year had overwatch league not existed just from being in the middle of all those conversations yeah. talking to team mm -hmm. owners etc cetera, etc cetera. um so that was accelerated by owl's existence now the other thing is it was can not I just add to that though quickly, Monty. And all of those team owners uh, in now deleted tweets all publicly said Activision Blizzard have brought us a new level of commercialization and sponsorship deals none of us thought were possible. How's that working today, dickhead? How's that what? fucking worked out today? <laughs> well, weren't at the time some of it them was also true. like that's that's, bullshit. Weren't some of them doing the kind of dragon thing like deal. that's too expensive for me? I'm out. Like, weren't some of them like that too? Right? Like, like. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's different levels of complicity in these teams, right? And, and speaking from CLG's perspective, th this may sound like uh, I'm jerking myself off, but literally we loved esports and we were trying, we were like, we don't survive in the LCS, we don't have any money, and L we have the LCS come to us and say, it's going to cost this much money, we you're pretty much guaranteed a slot if you submit an RFP, but you got to pay for it. We're like, well, fuck, we, we, what, what are we going to do, right? And so we, I, I, even at that time that I'm selling to the garden, I don't think that, that, that like we are selling a, a, a dream or snake oil or like a or like a bad multiplier or anything. I, I think a large part of that was to, to Richard Lewis's point. Um, I just didn't have the business acumen. I think if I could go back in time today after doing <sighs> millions of dollars in ad budget and VC, I think I might have been able to see it. But even then, I, also I don't know. Think, dude, I, like no, in 2015, I, I think it's a lot less of a lie. Uh, no, no, that's what I'm saying. Uh, look, yeah. look, you have to consider the context at the time. So, Devin, the reason why MSG invested was you guys had just had sold out finals at Madison Square mm. Garden. Yeah, we in saw that in three minutes. Path. In three yeah. minutes. Yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and like, mm. you know, 2015, 2016 was the peak of LCS viewership. This is what we're yeah. talking about the 400,000, 500,000 concurrence. And Four the story TSM was versus there. CLG. The story mm. was there. Mm -hmm. CLG had won the title at MSG. They, you know, it was they, their matches were the biggest with the rivalry with TSM. Like, there is no reason to believe that it would we would have one quarter the viewership now that we had then. Yeah. I, don't think I, I, I didn't see it. Thing. Yeah. Like, like, man, I, I came in that stadium in 2015. It's just a crowd fucking roaring. We sold out in three minutes. You're in the front row. People are freaking out. You're staying on that stage, and you're like, "This is it. This is this is esports is going to become the next traditional sports." Like, like at that time, the 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 the, the first esports is dying video I made was like two and a half years ago, three years ago ish. That's what I was like, eh. And then like, I think what really allowed me to see that was the ROAS problem. I think that's the easiest way to define why esports doesn't make sense. And so like, if you look at the return on investment that you can get from ad spend in esports, right? It's like 0. 0.00001. Uh, we did, uh, I, I was I was talking to a computer hardware company, okay? And they did a $250,000 sponsorship with an esports team that everyone here would know, household name, okay? They sold 14 PCs in a year. That's the kind of ROI yep. you were getting so, off of esports so teams. I versus said, I, 3X, 4X yeah, off of traditional ads. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I, I said, I said we'd, we'd, shift the conversation into the advertising. Well, why because... is that so bad? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait so there a second, wait there a second, though. If All we're right, going right. to go in this order, like we did the franchise and set up, here comes franchising, here's what we bought in. <laughs> like, there's two things to say. One, the reason why, I here's the thing, I'm sort of on Richard's camp that, like, if you actually just identify essentially in the linear chain of action who could have stopped all of this, it absolutely is the LCS owners. Like, for, first things first, if they could go back in a time machine, here's what you do. You'd go to Riot and you go, scrap all that, where we buy 
buy $10 million slots. First of all, I'm Cloud9, that's Team Liquid, that's TSO. We are the LCS, by the way. Like, you can replace us in the future, but not today. So since you need us and we have the leverage, here's what happens. It's not $10 million a slot. It's like a million a slot just to show that you're on the big boy table. You're not a Wait. scrub and you're committed. You come in, you do the million dollar. And then I'll tell you what, after that, we pay you nothing. You figure out as our partner how you're going to bring all this viewership with our millions, by the way. And we're all going to grow together. Because here's the problem I have, right? Two things. One, by definition, you can't be in League of Legends if you're not in the LCS, if you're in North America. Like, you're nobody. There isn't an open circuit like CSGO. And by the way, everyone who taught, who touts the CSGO open circuit, I'll just say two names that if you know the circuit, you'll know why it doesn't make sense. So Evil Geniuses is terrible, but they stay in all the leagues because they have the partner slots. Not a franchise slot, but a partner slot. So they are partnered with the TO. In Ents is probably one of the best independent orgs without VC ever. And they constantly complain that they can never get into a bloody blast tournament because you have to win about 18 qualifiers and about 50 matches in a row just to get where Evil Geniuses yeah. starts, essentially. So then to bring it back, right, that, that shows that already, unless you do what I say, you sort of get together and you force your leverage. If you act independently, the question if you were Cloud9 was, do you want to be in LCS anymore? If you don't, leave, don't pay the bill. But then the other thing I would say to bring it all back again is this. Isn't the person, if you guys say it's not the, the fault of the VC group or the team owners, surely Riot has to answer the question you just put forward, Monty, which is, wait a minute, how did we all spend, do the math, $100 million and you give us a third less viewership? Like, what? Like, I'd go, where's my $100 million? What happened? What did you do with it? Like, shouldn't that money logically have been used to build up the product and make it awesome and get us all these great deals that we'd all make the rev share of? So there's a lot there. Jump in on whatever you want. Well, I, the, the, real quick, the, the, the team owners, I, I think, never had a coordinated front against Riot because what would happen yep. is that we would always get together and we'd be like, all right, guys, we're all going to stand together, hold hands, and we're going to attack. They can't do this to us anymore. And what Riot would do every single time is they would piecemeal us all individually, put us in separate rooms, and go, look, motherfucker, we'll fuck you. You're right. fucked. It's all these other guys are be And yes. we always cracked. Every one of yes. us, we always cracked. There's just a little bit of pressure on that, and that's how they kept us. Like, if there had been yeah. a true like esports union, we would have been able to manipulate stuff like the price of the slots and things like that. But just nobody, like the esports teams, were so busy fighting among themselves, it's like herding cats, you know? Yeah, and let's also yeah. be real. I mean, there was like a tiered system within League of Legends that we've talked about before. You've got the cartel, you know, Steve, Jack, Reggie, and then you know maybe George, you know, your guy. You know, we were never at the bit, cartel. But, but, we tried. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> completely fucked over, you know, which I, yeah. I know he told that story a, uh, not that long ago. But, you know, it's yeah. like it, it's it, it once once there was a drop off, those guys would actively work against other owners, you know, like they did Rick Fox and people like that. You couldn't even come in as a new guy unless you were willing to pay fealty to them. And then obviously Riot were giving them the sweetheart deals because there was that element of control within itself. So, I mean, yeah, there could never be a unified front. And this never well, been well, I will say, I will say, I will say that, you know, I think one of the reasons why they were very eager to push me out was that I was actually starting to have success with a unified front. In fact, I had diversity. I haven't talked about this before, but there were instances where Riot was up to some shenanigans with their structures in which I had lawyers write letters that were then signed by all of the LCS teams and given to Riot. And that scared them a lot. Um, and so I think that was another reason why they wanted me out of, of the league and they kicked yeah. me out was because I was actually for the first time ever able to start to get all of the owners on the same page. And when I was in Los Angeles from, you know, visiting from Korea, I would actually call meetings with the owners of all of the teams to get together and talk this. And I was getting signatures on paper and like official complaints starting to be submitted. And that made them very unhappy with me. <laughs> yeah, you got union busted, bro. Like that's that's what happened. Uh, yeah, and, and, and by the by the way, by the way, some of these issues were like literally trying to convince things that riot to do things that were not to do things that were illegal. Mm -hmm. Like we we literally were like writing letters, being like, "We are not going to let you do this thing that is illegal." So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so, I want to I want to just keep keep it on the ownership tier for now, right? Because you know, one of the things that I've noticed that's happening in the industry that that's creating this esports winter is there are a lot of sponsors that have come into esports. They're not endemic, but they've been around long enough that we sort of do 
consider them part of the landscape. But what I've noticed is a lot of them are either scaling down how many orgs they sponsor or they're not re-signing at all and they're leaving the space in its entirety. And this has been explained away by, oh, there's an economic downturn, we're in a recession, just don't call it a recession. You know, there's a lot of that going on. But in reality, if you look at the marketing budget and how much it's decreased globally, it's like a 9% uh, decrease in US marketing budget as a whole, uh, which certainly we're seeing a lot more than 9% of sponsors kind of exiting out of esports right now. And I, I know from talking to people behind the scenes, loads of these esports orgs have just taken deliverables for granted. They're not delivering on any of it. They're not even following it up. They've promised things that they're going to get like players or influencers under their banner to do stuff that they don't do. And that might have flown when esports was the hot shit in 2016 to 2018. Now that it isn't the hot shit anymore, sponsors are saying to orgs, you didn't deliver on any of this shit. And we're well, out. We're not resigning. I mean, here's here's the thing. As, you know, as, as if we want to transition the conversation to to the advertising front, there's been there's been a couple of different problems. First off, the problem is, is that starting at the end of last year and into the beginning parts of this year, a lot of advertising budgets were frozen um, because people didn't know what the economy was doing. And there was a lot of fear within the industry. And they've started to get kind of unlocked now for later in this year. And so we're starting to see movement. That's something we've experienced at, at last Free Nation year. So one of the other issues, though, to your point, Richard, is that this chains into the conversation about, you know, growth that we had in terms of the venture capital with the audience, which is that there was going to be this infinite growth and therefore a sponsorship, you know, a prominent sponsorship in esports was worth millions and millions and millions of dollars because the number of eyeballs that were going to be on your on the logo on the stream, right, because this was back when LCS did have significant viewership and that was going to convert into people buying the products. I think what has become apparent, like very clear to these sponsors is that when they sponsor a league or a team, they are paying millions of dollars. They're getting like a logo on Not the shoulder. Not exposure, basically, just exposure. Yeah. A, lo yeah, a logo on the shoulder. And by the way, guys, if you don't think the time that that logo is on screen is tracked, it absolutely is like down to the second a lot of the times. So literally there, there are services that track this information that say like, okay, we saw this team on camera for X amount of time. Here's the number of seconds that this logo was visible. Here was the viewership at the time the logo was visible. So they're very active in tracking these efforts and it's very granular a lot of the time. And then the other factor is they would say, we have these deliverables. We are going to give you these YouTube videos. Unfortunately, the teams themselves have done a shit job for the most part at making sure that people watch their content at engaging in good branding at making compelling content so what they're actually selling is three million dollars for a logo and then a two thousand view youtube video and so advertisers yeah sorry i i, I you can I want you to finish. I have so much to say about this topic, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the value has been incredibly low. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, here's the other thing, guys. Fans do not react. And I'm sure a lot of you are going to hit the YouTube comments and talk about this. Fans have reacted very badly to sponsorships from teams and leagues, as in they don't go buy the products. They don't feel that they're supporting the team by buying the products. They don't feel that they're supporting the league or the broadcast by buying the products. It is very you know, different. It's really sad, Monty. I've heard there's even some TSM fans <laughs> didn't put their entire life savers into FTX. I mean, come on, guys. You know, you're going to support the team. Come on. I mean, I was just going to add to that point, though, as well. Like, I, I like esports fans are scumbags and they don't spend any money. But, like, at this stage, who could blame them? How many times do you have to get burnt, you know? I, I, I disagree because you, one of the weird things about us is that so with our content, I mean, Richard, your Substack's doing very well. You've had very successful yeah, but Patreons I'm not, I'm, in the past. I'm, I'm not. I'm so I'm not reaching out to esports fans. I'm reaching yeah, out that, to Richard Lewis fans. You know what I mean? Sure, and, sure, and, sure, and, sure. And, and like, but I'm just. I'm saying, even saying I am, fuck, fuck, fuck esports fans. Like I know who my, <laughs> okay. I know who my tribe are. You know what I mean? R Richard, there are a lot of fans that do support esports fans that will support individual influencers and content creators. So what mm -hmm. they what brands have found 
is that, and Devin, I will let you talk and you can okay. talk. I know you have Dude. a lot of information about this. <laughs> I literally run millions in ad budget on this shit. I can I know. say so okay. much. Okay. So, so we all know, we all know that esports advertising fucking sucks. OK, but we have had success at Last Free Nation because when we do things like freeze pipe, you guys actually went out and bought a oh. shitload of freeze pipes. OK, so we know that it's not esports. OK, it is the way that esports has been advertised. Now, part of that is that a lot of people watch our content. LFN currently does almost one point five po million podcast downloads a month across all of our podcasts. So you guys are crushing it. Thank you. But it's that when people feel an affinity, whether it's through an influencer or you guys directly supporting us, you know this supports us. And if you see a product you like, you go buy it. Nobody has bought a product because it was on CLG's jersey. I don't believe that that's true. Like, or very few people, hence Devin's example of the, you know, 17 PCs that have been sold. Yeah. So for, I don't know why. I can't tell you why psychologically it works this way, where people do not support the sponsors of teams and leagues, but they just appear not to do that. And, and to put a cap on this, I will say that as an example, we LFN is currently in talks with sponsors that have left LCS because it's not that they don't want the esports audience. It's the price of sponsoring the LCS versus the return they get is so high and they see value in us, not in the league. It's because it's the steps removed. Right. So if you look at a funnel, it's the LCS and then the teams and then the players. And by so for you to buy a product from an influencer, you need to know, like, and trust that person. Well, that's three steps removed of the opportunity to do so because you have to tell the story all the way down the funnel. Right. So what we do at uh, Novo is we run, like I said, ad budget. And so I've run ad budget against esports. I've run ad budget against uh, Twitch um, and all these different places. My ad budget this year is six X what it was last year. Want to know the only difference? Last year, 70% of my business was Twitch. This year, it's less than 3%. Why? Because nobody is spending on esports teams, on Twitch, on, and these places because they're not getting that return on investment. What happens is that when somebody puts ad budget into that and they, and they do it for exchange of these deliverables, these brands come in, they'll, they have what's uh, experimental ad budgets. So um, one of the crazy things I learned when I went into the agency world, every single dollar that's been spent on esports pretty much is just a very small portion of a gigantic ad budget of these brands. They're using yep. uh, experimental ad budget, which is usually five to 10% of their total spend uh, to, to kind of figure out what happens. And they're, they're basically trying to answer a question. Am I going to get burned or not? And so what has happened across Twitch and, and, and esports is that these, like whether the deliverables are completed or not, what, what everyone needs to understand about advertising is the gold standard for advertising is Google AdWords. And your typical ROAS, your typical return on putting a dollar into Google AdWords is between 1.3 and 3.4 dollars per dollar. So if I, put, if I sell a shirt for 10 bucks, I can, I, I can expect to get three to four dollars of those shirts back if, every single time that I put that in, okay? So that's just the guarantee. Like, so, so if I put my money in there, it's like mutual funds. I just, I just get that return back 99% of the time. It's easily trackable. So Unless esports and influencer marketing can beat that ROAS, there is no reason not for those brands to throw into PPC. Combine that with like bad sales structure, bad conversations, bad relationships with the teams, back and forth, uncompleted deliverables. Brands don't need to be in esports. They're just going to say, fuck it. Yeah, take our spend and put it somewhere else. I've literally had brands tell me, I'm I, like, yo, get us out of Twitch. Like, and, and, and by the way, this is notwithstanding the, the, like all the other freaking controversies, the hot tub stuff, the whatever, whatever you go down the list of things in esports sports that are just not brand friendly that could just even if they were getting a good roast would just get them out of this out of the, the, the sphere right like there are so many reasons just not to advertise in this space yeah uh, let me and, tie it to yeah. what richard was saying though because here's the thing richard you actually inadvertently nailed what monty's talking about though which is the reason why i would advertise with richard lewis is because you have richard lewis fans dude a richard yeah. lewis fans way more valuable than a generic esports fan i mean i've made this joke mm -hmm. before to monty that like a couple of years ago there was an nfl playoff game and at this playoff game if you can't tell this was a complete plant they had the actor rob law and he was just there like Doing like that Hollywood <laughs> smile. And as he did that, he just had a hat that said NFL. And I said, Monty, yeah. that has to be a plant. No one in the world is just a fan of the NFL. Like, he wasn't a fan even of a team there. Just the NFL, not even like the Rams so or funny. something. So like the yeah. joke of that though is like, that's why, by the way, that corporate stuff's a nightmare because they, they, they want you to believe they could be a fan of the NFL. But even the NFL doesn't have fans. So to sort of answer this question, half of the problem to me of the funnel that Devin's describing is, if I'm a fan of League of Legends, I'm usually either a fan of the game or the player, right? Yes. I, which yeah. 
whatever it is. When I watch the LCS and they go, sponsored by Nationwide, I don't go, well, I love League of Legends, so I should get Nationwide. I don't Mm -hmm. think, I love Doublelift, so I should get Nationwide. Those don't connect in my brain. Like, the game doesn't, like, in the same way as it's not a fan of the NFL. Now, I might be a fan of the team, right? But think of this even. If I'm a fan of Doublelift's team, well, we all know Doublelift played for CLG one year, then TSM a couple of years, and Team Liquid. So again, do I have a direct connection in my brain of, like, when I buy the Team Liquid sponsor, it helps Doublelift? Not really. But here's the thing. If somehow the campaign was double lift connecting with his real fans authentically dude i wasn't with i might buy this product then maybe then i would connect yep. so to me what? actually sort of going down to this grassroots approach upwards instead of the because the last thing i was going to say is this Devin. i get why the team orgs did it to begin with because just like franchise leagues this is a very traditional model that sponsors understand so you mm. think when you go to them you understand like right it's, it's like nascar you get this many seconds on screen you're the fourth one online on my jacket you know they sort of get that but the, the mistake that we made in esports is that model would never work for us like you say the ROI is terrible so actually we always needed essentially to revolutionize and in fact we need to educate the sponsors to some degree what yes do you think? 100% and, and what, what you said, Thorin, like, so what I just explained was the was the financial model, the, the, like the return on advertising spend, the objective thing. What Thorin just talked about is the second and equally as critical thing, which is the story. It's just that I am not invested enough as a fan, as a follower, as a person to actually get behind and buy a product. And a lot of that is because of the LCS's rules and, and, and the feast or famine attitude they've had around like, look, if you don't compete at the highest level, you're going to get fucking relegated. Okay, well, now I've got to import a bunch of Eastern players that are mechanically better, but don't have as good narrative because they don't speak fucking English. So, so like, yeah. how am I going to be able to make those attachments and create those stories, right? And something I hope we cover on the, on the podcast is we were talking about how impactful those CLG versus 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 TSM fights felt in 2017 with with the crowds roaring. You don't, like, even if the viewership is 10 to 14% down, the hype is, like, 300% down. The, the, like, uh, uh, in America, and, and, like, again, in China, you got people chanting outside of apartments and stuff like that. That's cool. But here, that feeling that you're talking about, Thorin, that feeling of, like, of, of, like, the the jazz of watching it, it's gone, it's dying. Or or that's, like, when I think of esports really dying, that's what I think of as the stories, as narratives. There's, like, three points to this. And so, okay, so the first First thing is, um, just overall, the owners massively watered down their own product. I know Duncan's been an evangelical about this for a long time. I've been singing off this hymn sheet as well. And that is that esports is esports and influencers are influencers and gaming is gaming. And there's a Venn diagram where this can all meet up in the middle. But, you know, when you when you use like, oh, Ninja is the face of esports, He's not. He's like the face of streaming. He's not the face of esports. Like he did compete in Halo. Yeah, he's got legit esports chops, but that's not what we know him for. Him running around, you know, back on, you know, you know him, him doming people in pub games <laughs> isn't the same to, thing. For right? me on Renegades, actually, back in yeah, the day. Yeah, I remember, <laughs> right? So, so, what it, so the owners massively watered down that esports niche, and we really had yeah. to have a good handle on what that niche was because the hardcore audience is the one that's going to spend on esports products. So that's point one. Point two, the reason I think people sort of passively absorb the advertising in things like leagues is because the activations fucking suck. Like, here's a yeah. multi, multi million dollar idea right now for free, right? Like, you've got players who had to like leave home because their parents didn't support their esports choices, right? Well, and you've got MasterCard as a fucking like sponsor. So, you know, why can't I interview a player talking about how good it was to like be able able to go to you know apply for my first ever credit card and it helped you know it helped me fucking like make ends meet and it helped me make rent till i got over the hump and got my first esports paycheck and i couldn't have done it without them and you apply this like it's completely fake by the way but you you apply this like friendly veneer of debt slavery you know but like it would work people would go wow mastercard the compassionate and ethical banking lender you know (laughs) yeah Uh, yeah. and then the third Mm. point is just a good idea uh, yeah, dude, I'm full of them, right? So what can I say? Uh, but you know, so uh, the 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 uh, third point is the the narratives that 
we build around iconic players, it's so obfuscated now. You're talking about that hype dying down. It's because it's saturation. It is the same player, essentially, just with a different name, doing the same interview. We make the same hype video for them. They were said they were bad in this team, but now they're in this team and they might be good. And it's just the same shit. And everyone's seen it a million times. There's no innovators. There's no creators. And people don't know how to find a unique angle on the stories we need to tell to make yeah. esports truly compelling and for the for new people to engage with it, which is a big agree. problem, you know. Well, it, and it's just like you know when you when you slap the logo. I mean, nobody just has an affinity. It, it, they they applied the same sports marketing that works for an older audience onto esports products, which is just like we will put our name on the analyst desk, but that doesn't really drive any affinity. Like I don't ever feel that I understood, you know, State Farm's creative from watching the state farm analyst desk like am i supposed to think state farm does analysis because that was never made clear to me like it's, well, it's really feels discombobulated from the broadcast and i get that with the teams too i mean the teams themselves have been so bad for the most part about putting out branded content and making it compelling and something that people actually legitimately want to watch by the way, this is like an abstract point, but I'll make it for comedic relief. And there's a point within it, which goes like this. When you go on the internet, I understand I'm somewhat of an internet boomer, but even so, right, one thing I've never understood about the internet ever is click-through ads. I can tell you, Devin, I've been on the internet for about 25 years, never even accidentally clicked one. Like, if I even accidentally, I'd yeah. throw my mouse at the wall, you know. So he I've never understood one it. iPhone once exactly. and he never looked back. So I've never yeah. understood that form of advertising. Essentially, to me, the joke is, even though I didn't used to have ad block at 25 years ago, I always treated the internet like I had ad block in like the hood of my eyes, as it were. Like, if I see an ad here, my brain doesn't see the ad. And even yes. add in, when you play video games, it's like this. You don't like look at all the ads in the background on like you walk around a level in some dystopian world. You go, who gives about whatever? That's just background noise, flavor text, meme. I, I feel like esports, the experience of trying to do the traditional models like that. Like, when you say that thing, Monty, they're like, and here we are at the nationwide analyst desk. My brain just goes like, blah, 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 analyst desk, right? It's the analyst desk. I actually, if anything, like, my brain helps me not like be in a nightmare fucking Deus Ex slash they live dystopia <laughs> by deleting that information for me. It's really good. So I feel like if you're an average fan, that stuff just becomes signal noise. I don't think you even listen to it. It doesn't seem like it works at all to me. So so you are a, a power user. Um and and, and, and so that's, least, that's like, what I tell people anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so to to understand, basically a brand is going to come to who usually it's an agency doing their advertising. They're gonna say, look, we want this percentage of the campaign to be exposure and we want this percentage of the campaign to be conversions. And and so typically what in traditional sports, you're going for like ninety to ninety-five percent conversion plays because of one concept in marketing, which is called impression to hit ratio. And basically what that says is an impression, which means that I have impressed upon you a logo or an ad or a, a something for you to think about this name Coca-Cola is one impression, right? That there is a certain number of impressions that will happen that will make a person more likely to buy that thing than they would buy some other thing like Mountain Dew. And that's a real thing. There's a lot of marketing research that shows this. There's a lot of academic science to back this up, that this a certain number of impressions will um, result in a sale at some point. At some point in somebody's life, they'll go to a gas station and buy that thing. The problem is that endemics that came into esports expected conversions. They expected very high numbers of conversions, and all esports had to offer was in, was impressions. Now, what nobody talks about is that there is a quality to an impression. Not all impressions are created equal. Esports sure. impressions are dog shit because of the, all the reasons we just talked about, right? So an impression from a qualified influencer that is recommending a product, even if it's just an exposure play, is going to be way more value than the esports impressions. And I guess what, hap what, what happened was when these non-endemic brands that have been used to getting actually pretty good impressions through people like MSG and through people like the 76ers uh, because they're uh, again these the people that are following those teams by their cities were like diehard fans and those impressions actually counted for a lot from an exposure play expected to get those same results from esports but because of the players switching around all the three reasons that Richard just listed, we didn't get those impressions at that same value. And so everybody just eventually pieced out. And the result was massive brand burnout over the past three to four years. Brands just say, yep. fuck it. I don't, I don't need to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they did. And they did run them out. But and a part of this is, again, the fault of the teams and the fault of the leagues for instead of trying to fix the issues. Right. Instead of trying to say, wow, this 2000 viewed YouTube video really probably isn't going to deliver 
the kind of valuable impressions that they want and maybe going back and doing, you know, spending some more money to create content that could be valuable to these advertisers. What they did instead was they were just like, oh, this deals up next sucker in line. Yeah. Come pay us, you know, $3 million. So they burned through a bunch of people. And I can just tell you guys, it's not that big companies or big brands and advertisers don't want the esports audience. Because here's the key about to understand about the esports demographic. It is wholly unique. The people who watch esports are not getting advertised to uh, usually as traditional sports fans, okay? So mm -hmm. it's the same demo, which is like 18 to 35 year old males, but it's entirely different than the those same group of people, that same demo that you're advertising to in traditional sports or advertising to in other mediums. So it's the same demo, but different people. So they want access to these people. By the we way, I just wine. can't handle it. It looks like he's drinking like fucking Crisco or something like some fucking sunflower oil. That massive, like, it's like, <laughs> Crisco, like Judy like, Luck, down oil. motherfucker. Like, it's like, get that I in a it. gallon of water <laughs> and I count it by having like a gallon bottle. It's just like, a, a, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just drinking so, way too much. <laughs> so, but, but the point is, guys, is that the, the brands, and I think Devin can talk to this, they're still interested in advertising with the space. They're just trying to figure out how to actually get to the esports fans in an effective way, which is one of the reasons that we are having success in terms of ad sales right now. Because again, it's not that everybody was burned. They're just, they're done with the bullshit from the teams and the, and the tournament organizers. I don't know. And they're looking... I it's hard for me at this point to convince people to go into esports plays from a budget perspective. Like uh, for me to get that kind of budget approved is a lot harder than for me to go to YouTube or to pay per click. Now uh, it didn't used to be that way. Like it, like two or three years ago in the agency, um, again, like like a huge percentage of our budget was being spent on Twitch. Now, relative, right, our budget went up a lot more this year, but that was because we we diversified into YouTube and into uh, places that just make more sense from a rose perspective. I, I just I just don't brands that have heard of of esports at this point have a kind of foul taste in their mouth, and there's been a, a couple of real big offenders. It, now, look, yes. there's always gonna be shit to sell. Um, there's always gonna be shit to sell, right? You'll always be able to build a agency, and, and especially if you're sophisticated um, like yourself, and, and be able to sell this. But um, a couple of big contenders have really burned out a lot of brands, uh, and, and and I'll I'll point the finger at um, some of the larger tournament organizers outside yep. of Riot. Uh, who yeah. have charged those brands a lot of money. And I can tell you definitively that they will never come back. And they're continuing to do it as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, to, to that point as well, though, I, I think it's kind of important that, you you know, we acknowledge that th the esports fan is a thing, right? I, I get that. But it, it's more just to do with the overall demographic, I believe. Like in my experience from talking to people, there's a certain archetype of a desirable customer in terms of, you know, what age you want to shoot for, how much disposable income they're going to have, et cetera, et cetera. And it just so happens that there's a lot of that archetype in esports. And so this is why the history of esports is essentially various entities attempting to monopolize esports that's pretty much all the history is going all the way back to the early esports progenitors they were speculators uh pre pre the first esports bubble you know pre cpl um and people want to control the landscape because it gives you access to you know this young demographic of customers that you'll be able to sell to not just once not just twice multiple products over multiple years they grow up your thing they have children of their own and immediately plug them in as cu future customers and on and on and on and on it goes you know kind of like the way people used to think about car ownership and things like that back in days gone by in america and so ultimately this has been the fundamental problem we've never actually like recognized that we've never recognized what an esports fan is and how do we activate them it's almost like an incidental thing that an esports fan just happens to be this type of desirable demographic that everyone's essentially pitching to you know oh. so and, and and that i think is a much bigger problem in the terms of that like we've never conceptually understood the scale of esports because there's so much conflation going on and to your point um like 100 percent correct i think a lot of that is the lack of sophistication by actually like real big hitter fucking agencies coming in and like they do in traditional sports and other places and being like yo these are what the demographics are so like so we use a platform uh called uh geek it's a giq and i'll just look at 100 thieves demographics right now right so you've got 68.12 percent people under 24 uh, 25% above 20, uh, 25 to 29, 93% male. 
These are people with some disposable income, right? Um, their average, let's see if I just check the table on that. Uh, between ten between thirty thousand and forty nine thousand dollars a year, thirty percent, fifty thousand to seventy four thousand, twenty seven percent. That's those are pretty like, people got some yeah. money to spend, right? So like you said, this demographic is there. Like like they can do it, but accessing that person and understanding that and, and using creating ads that, that that appeal to those people, that lack of sophistication is what is killing ads in esports. There's just not enough professionals. And and, and, and to that point, at CLG I wasn't that professional either. I didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. And, and, and so many of these deals got done arbitrarily. Like, like, like we were throwing out sponsor numbers. There's no, like it, now if I do a deal, right, I got a CPM. I know exactly what those a thousand people are worth. I, I, I can compare it to an AdWords category or a Bing category. I can know what that keyword is worth. Back at CLG, people were like, well, yeah, what do you think you should be sponsored for? Uh, uh, $200,000 sound good. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Okay. That, that's like 99% of deals that got done in esports, Right. And I think still get done today. There just isn't enough sophistication. Yeah. And I, and I think as well, a, a much bigger problem is there's a lot of people who talk about esports and how they believe in esports and believe in the success of esports. You know, I used to do this, right? Like I used to believe esports was going to be a successful product that would get to a place, it would become mainstream. And and what I realize now is actually driving it in that direction has essentially killed it. You know, it, it needed to stay niche and on the periphery. Like I, I, I wrote an article, I've never published it. It's called The Party's Over, but I compare it to what happened with the commercialization of punk rock. And it's like one minute, it's like this edgy outlier fringe culture that you buy into. The next moment you can get a Nevermind the Bollocks MasterCard and fucking John Lydon's advertising butter on fucking British television. You know, it's like it got commercialized and it's not the same thing anymore. It's actually the antithesis of what it was and that's kind of happened a lot with esports but anyway that's like a moot point the, the for me i think the fundamental problem at the core of the great economic pyramid is i don't know of one person in esports who truly believes and truly doesn't treat it like greater fool theory like i think that's why crypto the implosion of crypto kind of watching that has also given people a bit of a wake up call about esports because like oh shit it's kind of the same thing it has no intrinsic value <laughs> everyone's upselling <laughs> Every, it's all smoke and mirrors what's going on and so i, I like uh, for me we needed people who came in early to build Tan, you know, like actual tangible revenue streams, things yeah. you can touch, things you can measure, but we never did. And instead, everyone was saying, hey, look, we've got a slot in a league that's definitely worth 20 million. And in fact, it could be worth 40 next year. That's what those teams are going to be charged. And it's like, okay, is any of that real? No, it isn't. Okay. But don't worry, we're going to get out. We're going to cash out in five years. There's another idiot coming along who'll buy this for 600 million. And we all go, and we all retire, and we all get a yacht. And it's like, I never, I've never talked to anyone on a business level that didn't want to cash out of esports. They're not true believers, you know. And you know, you, and I'll, I'll, I guess it'll be my turn to shake the spice up here. You know who yeah, I cool. blame for getting those people out and that level of sophistication is the fucking publishers because they literally mm. held on to everything. They, they, they kept everything for themselves. Yep. There was uh, yep. now, now it angers me so fucking much that now Valorant is like, oh, by the way, there's no franchise fee. Like yeah 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 we'll just you know we'll just let you in. We'll just pay. Oh, and oh by the way we're gonna be doing re revenue splits with the teams yeah well, like yep. shit that we asked for in the fucking LCS for years basically like, when oh, I said they should have argued for well, the beginning yeah exactly right. Right. like like like, we, like where the fuck was this like like okay like, like now because, now they like right Evan, here's here's the thing about the Valorant <laughs> partnerships it all goes back to the fact that the publishers have been hiding the revenue the real revenue of esports. They have Which is their data. fucking skin sales. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have data yeah. surrounding their microtransactions that they should, even though you can't always pin one to one, right? Uh it's an it's a marketing exercise. So they can deny that this revenue exists because they can't definitively say that esports is selling skins. They can't yeah, it's, but it's a marketing. They can do item. things. Here's here's yeah. what they can do. They can do, they can show that when you know, when a, a famous player plays a skin at the League of Legends World Championship, and then that skin sales spikes above normal for the next week afterwards, it's probably pretty clear where the source of that revenue is coming from, right? But the teams are never allowed to know this information. No. It is kept in tightly locked boxes at the developers. Um, I have heard, and I, I haven't talked about this before, and I have to be very careful about how I say this so I don't burn a source. So how can I say this? It is not recent information. It is not information from the last. It is from the very early days, um, you know, early days of the LCS at Riot, I would say. Um, so within the first few seasons, I have heard that 
Riot at that point in time had tied 25% of their revenue to esports. I don't know how true that is, but that has been told to me by people who I think would know that information. Well, bro, um, I mean, I mean, look, like at the time that we're spending millions of dollars upkeeping players babysitting for Riot, and they're paying us a pittance of that, they are making millions of dollars off Star Guardian Lux. I'm in the corner with CLG. Please, sir, please, can I yes, have exactly. a pittance? Can I have one? <laughs> and they're like, you know what they say to me? Can we sh can we make a skin? Can we have CLG in there for a little bit? Guess no. what? No, we're not sure you're going to be in the LCS forever. We can't do that. Yeah, and then the they turn reason. around the on reason, Valorant. Devin. They turn around on Valorant, and they're like, oh, by the way, skin sales, by the way, revenue share, by the way. Hey, fuck you, dude. You just fucked up with this whole thing, and now you're going to go over here and tell us this? Like, what? What is it? This but, is but, but so here's, fucking the thing, much. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, Devin. They had they had you buy the balls on your twenty five thousand dollar limitation of liability on li liability contract. And here's the thing. They make a hundred percent of the money when they sell Star Guardian Lux. Yeah. When of course. When when Bjergsen plays Star Guardian Lux, they make a hundred percent of the money. If they make a CLG or a TSM skin, they don't make a hundred percent of the money anymore. So why would they make it? But There's then they go back no and they do that on Valorant. <laughs> That's what I don't okay. understand. <laughs> they are, but they are now because they real. Here's the thing, guys. You just have to put this in your brain. If esports was so unprofitable for publishers and for Riot, why would they double down with Valorant now? Why would they say yeah. we want to pay? We want to select handpick our teams, and we're it, remember it's not a franchise; it's a partnership. They can get relegated, but we are going to give you guys a systemic advantage through fees through rev share, and we're going to pay you. And by the way, as I said before, right now, right now, the LCS teams are given $2 million a year approximately in rev share, okay? Yeah. Jensen's so contract is fucking $4 million. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Let's bridge into that. because It's one player. <laughs> Like, what the fuck do we do with that, man? It's, it's like the publishers, it's all the publishers. They take everything. But, They're Galactus. They fucking yes, consume yes, exactly. but, and nothing before, satiates before, before their endless get, hunger. Yeah, exactly. But before we get into this, dude, that's the whole problem is that no one knows how much money the publishers are actually tying to their esports efforts. But we know it must be good because they would Riot would not have done it in, in Valorant otherwise. And we wouldn't see all these publishers so hot yeah, I, I actually disagree. I don't think I don't think they're doing what you think they're doing in Valorant. You think they've learned some kind of lesson? This is Riot Games. They don't learn shit. <laughs> they're never going to change. They knew everything on the day they knew it until their mind changed, and then they knew that all along, and they wreck on history. Like basically, they're writing the Ten Commandments every fucking year and telling you there was never any other Ten Commandments. Why the, the change? Ones. Right. Well, so here, this is what I think is going. I on. actually I, don't know. Like I'm asking it's, you. It's <laughs> not a change. It's not a change. It it, it it's a it, it's an illusion. It's a mirage like so much <laughs> in esports right because what they're actually doing in my opinion is very similar to what they did in the early days remember when when riot games descended from the holy mountain full of great <laughs> ideas all they did was take a freemium model that was super popular in asia and brought it to the west using banking uh, uh, money you know that was all they really did but of course they invented esports in 2009 we were there we remember so they came down from the holy mountain and they said to everybody hey like, do you, want, do you like, do you like shitty MOBAs? Like, do you like, do you like this badly coded game? Here you go, have it for free. Here's a red t-shirt, la la la. And it was skipping around all of the lands, no matter how small, how local. And everyone went, wow, these Riot Games people are cool. And so they all made a beeline to it. They they got all the casters to come in, remember? Like, from established games, like guys like Joe Miller and D-Man, you know, legends. And they all come over and suddenly they're casting it and everyone's streaming it and they're giving out skins and it grows and it grows and it grows. And it grows. And then they even go to tournament organizers. Hey, DreamHack, want to run a tournament? Hey, like, uh, you know, IGL, want to run a tournament? Uh, you know, do, do, uh, MLG, do you want to run a tournament? They're all running these tournaments. And then they go, right, we're about ready for a fucking franchise league now. Shut it down. Uh, we might let you have a road show. I am, you can have a road show. But that's it. Everyone else, get the fuck off our game. It was ours the whole time. Thank you very much. That's what they're doing again with Valorant. It's just a slight twist on a classic Riot ploy. These people are essentially building up their loss leader esports venture because it creates an aspirational element to play the game. The fundamental kernel at the heart of every competitive game is, I gotta believe when I install it, I can go fucking pro maybe one day. That's how you keep the zoomers juiced in. And so they play the game over and over and over and over and over again. You know, maybe some go pro, most don't. There's leagues, there's ladders, there's badges. It's all bullshit. Who gives a fuck? 
fuck. Eventually, somewhere in that, you buy a skin with your mother's credit card, you know, and it's like, okay, right. Now it was all worth it for Riot because that happens a million times over. Why, it's, why, it, Richard, it's the same thing. It's the same thing, I think. Why, why, why the, um, why were they, why do they have to do that now with the skins and, and, and sharing it with teams and particularly why drop the franchise fee? What allows them to do that now? Because you know, if they could, they have to they, the and they could charge fee. that 10 million, they would fucking do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that's they, they not, yeah. No one's buying into a franchise league so, ever so it's, again. It's Activision Blizzard fucked that forever. Like, okay. Yeah. That, that, that's gone. <laughs> now it's partnered leagues. They've looked though. Like, right, so if I'm Riot Games and I'm an executive at Riot, right? Um, you know, I was going to make a terrible joke there, but let's keep it civil. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're party on a plane. Yeah, anyway, wipe my dick off. off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on, yeah, go on. In, uh, I, I was there. I was farting in someone's face. Uh, but but anyway, so uh, yeah, right. If I'm a if I'm a Riot Games executive and I'm looking at data points about what I use as a successful esports model, and I look over at what Activision Blizzard did, and then I look over at what Blast and ESL have done, which, by the way, you know, we're talking about an open circuit in Counter Strike. That's been an open circuit nah. for years. Duncan knows it. You know, you were you were on point. It's like you can't even get into these leagues. They pretend there's qualifiers, yep. but it's a qualifier for a qualifier for a regional qualifier, and then and you can't even make enough points to get into the tournaments. Yeah. It's a closed Insane. circuit. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at what those partnered leagues are doing, where you come in, you want it's just a little brown envelope that slides across the desk, and I get all of the benefits and all the commercialability, and I can guarantee that my teams are playing top teams over and over again, and we're going to have like stable viewership. I'm obviously going to take that. Oh, no one's paying ten mil to get into a franchise league in esports mm -hmm. ever again. So, so that's point number one. And point number two, I, I just think when you have big brands because that's the other thing we've got to stop thinking about orgs it's like the way you think Devin, about uh esports orgs is, is on point they're agencies they're receptacle yeah. for like ta yeah. they're receptacle for talent and influencers and they're selling shit whether it's you know a logo on a shirt or so, so, something else and so anyway if i want to get people to play this like new game this new hot game that's like, you know, uh, just come out. Well, what's the best way to do it? And a, a lot of kids engage with esports orgs. You know, we've got influencer orgs now, the great crossover that's coming in. Yeah, which I'm sure we'll there, get yeah. into. Mm -hmm. That's that's going to be the ultimate epicenter of everything. And so Riot are probably already looking like, yeah, it's okay. You know, we won't have an optic in because we actually, we've looked at the data and it doesn't quite work, but we will have this brand. We will have this brand. We will have that. And that's going to bring in a bunch of players because of that aspiration esports element for the hardcore player and that's the key thing the hardcore esports mm. player will make multiple purchases over a lifetime they value their account they treasure it they they want to look back at like skins from 2014 skins of their favorite player skins of their favorite team they're not some casual player that can go out and play 50 fucking fps games so yeah. that's the value there they're essentially okay, the sense. esports fan yeah. is the whale if you that's, oh for that's sure how yeah. I always, yes. that's how i always thought about it basically bro but, yeah go on uh, but dude, I just gotta say, like, you know, like the basic premise of business is like, okay, I make some money, I put it back into my business, and then the business makes more money. And like Riot completely ignored that for esports and just took mm. all. You know what they did? They hired a fucking shitload of people. I, I have to tell you all the story, okay? Oh. Like, because I bet Monty remembers this. So back <laughs> at the LCS, when like when you live in LA, you you gotta live in LA. You gotta go every weekend to. to uh, they, they they used to send these buses out. And the bus would be like some Russian guy driving it that you weren't sure was going to kill you or drive you to the correct destination. And they would they would fill all the players and the team owners and everybody into the bus, and they would drive you over to Santa Monica, and you would go play games. That's how they did this thing, okay? So at yep. one time for CLG, I I was I was sitting in the back of the green room, and my objective was to get my players back to my fucking house. And I shit you not, there were eleven fucking player managers that controlled this with none of them having any agency over the actual decision ever. Nobody could tell you where the fucking bus was. And, I was. and I'm like, why have you hired all these fucking people? None of them could do their job. None of them even know their job. No one has no system of hierarchy whatsoever. It's just a fucking shit show. Spend your money back on like reinvesting in the teams, reinvesting in stuff that actually makes sense. And we might've had a real fucking league. <laughs> Right, let me jump in on this. I've got a few angles. Like, first of all, the last thing you said there, this is one area, if anyone's watched my content, like somebody insight for long enough. I had this nailed years ago, guys, which is when Riot used to, because here's the way they used to do it, Devin. They didn't just pretend like, oh, esports is not related to our business. They would have, they had the goal to sell you the opposite. They would tell you, you know, we lose money doing yeah. esports, which yeah. we always used to make yeah. the analogy. That would be like Nike saying, oh, you know, I lose money making these sick commercials. And you go, don't you make all the money on the shoes? 
store. Hey, excuse me. What I do with selling shoes is unrelated to the advert. <laughs> that it's like everyone understands what a market budget is, you dickhead. And as you say there, the craziest thing is, here's one of the reasons, by the way, why the money never trickles down to the team orgs, to the players and everyone else. It just stays in the game gets coffers. Because I'll tell you the one really negative thing about the esports industry no one ever talks about, but you've actually touched on it there, Devin, which is this, right? The game dev is actually the person who has the golden goose. They're just printing money. They're, like, I've always said this about CSGO. Here's why you should have no hope that the CSGO devs care and will fundamentally change the game. Because in something like 2015, I remember reading a headline that said they'd made $2 billion revenue of fucking CSGO, a game that you barely have to update as no matter if, if that essentially means, guys, they make infinite money, therefore, whatever they want to do, they're doing it already. There's no yeah. incentive making them. So in this scenario, right, the problem you have is these game devs could easily share. Like what you're talking about there, I've, for three years on my shows, I've had game, have had team org owners basically say the one thing I want is, please, game dev, just let me, like you said, let me make a skin where you get your cut of it, but I essentially, I'm the barker, I'll sell it, I'll get all, but if you do that, everything can be, re revenue will make sense for everyone. But here's the other reason why those game devs don't do it. Because, mate, on the esports side of all of these game devs, because they think they have infinite money, they just hire a billion morons. They won't yeah. have, like, three execs. There'll be 50 <laughs> execs to do what yeah. three execs can do. You know this, dude. Every big company. By the way, spoiler, is a little gem for you. Companies like G4 were like that as well. They wouldn't just start with a few people. They'd hire everyone, and everyone gets a fucking cut. And it's like, oh, bro, you're getting an exec spot, you're getting a VP spot. You're getting... So there's no money left. Like, everyone's just a little fucking piggy on the teat, sucking away at that money, and there's never any for the teams. So one area, and we can bring this over now, because I know you want to talk about salaries, and that's obviously a yeah. classic inflationary mm -hmm. part of the industry. One of the other things you'll hear everyone start to talk about, notice this starting to creep into Valorant on Twitter the other day, salary caps. Mm. Oh, what about if the teams as a cartel, what if essentially, because they can't just actually find a way independently to not all do an arms race to the death for all the players, like you say, and sign Jensen for a contract that could never, ever deliver. E like, I don't think even people like the players get this, dude. I've told idiots like Simple and Double so many times, not a single move you make in game, even if you're faker, ever will pay your salary back. Like, it's actually, you're a lost leader as a fucking entity in the universe, mate. Like, this whole thing is mad. Like, but they all, by the way, the reason I bring that up is people like Simple actually think it's the other way around and that they're like oh, a god. They it, think it's, it's like, they think they're the 1930s baseball player. Like, I've been exploited. So what I'll say is this, yep. Devin, the reason it's a really weird industry is it's the only industry I'm not aware of where actually the bottom of the ladder, the player, doesn't get fucked in any way. He actually makes out like a bandit. He yeah, makes loads of money. Weird. He just doesn't know it. In fact, that's why the joke is they all do try to make like a Marxist rhetoric of like, I'm being exploited and I should really, and I just want to go, listen a bit, seize the means of production. You should just go up there. You should take all those, because you'd make nothing you're more and you wouldn't be able to pay yourself anything. So bring it all back. That's players... why everyone wants the salary cap. Right? So let's talk about this salary inflation because yeah, as bro, you say, LCS is 100%. the most famous example ever. This was yeah. a league where the viewership never made sense. I've always made this joke that like every year, a different LCS owner goes, it's my turn to pay Hoonie a million dollars. I'm like, why is anyone doing this? Like, has anyone paid Hoonie a million dollars ever helped? Like, but everyone's done it, you know, it's every team owner's done it by now. So come on, let's get into this topic. I know it's your field. I, I love it. I, I agree with everything you said. I, th I think that a huge aspect of this was, the, again, the feast or famine attitude that Riot put on the teams that is like, if you do not play the pay and get the best mechanical players, which is a very limited ladder, right? There's only 100 people in Challenger or whatever. Like, you are fucked. We're going to relegate you. You're gonna, you're, we're going to bring someone else to your spot. You always felt vulnerable. Even in franchising, you always felt vulnerable. Like, the whole idea of franchising for, for, for us originally, when they were like, oh, was you going to keep your spot? Okay, well, then we could have focused on storylines. I I could have had somebody, I could have had like an underperforming player, slightly underperforming, right? Like for like five years, six years, something like that, build up their brand and grow them. No, I've got to import 60 Chinese people because they're the best at the game. And now, and now when they go up on stage and it's like, you won, they're like, thank you for, well, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, right? Like, 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 that's all they know. That's the only English they know. So it's like everyone's like, well, I can't associate with this player because like I don't really understand their story. And then the teams could have brought in translators, like brought like like because that person is not like an uninteresting person. They're an awesome person. They just don't have any fucking ability to communicate it. So it's like if you brought in a translator, you brought in someone to tell that story. And said, look, this is why this matters. This person came from their their their, their home country to tell this story. It would have been amazing, but that never happened. And, and, and like I feel like I feel like what has occurred is this just like. The, with player salaries, man, is like, again, the publishers basically offloaded these players onto us. The players are in secret Discord chats with Excel spreadsheets in CSGO, right? With listing their salaries. Mm -hmm. 
and saying, oh, this team is only paying us this. We know together as five people we can go to the team and threaten that if we don't get a 20, 30, or 40 percent increase in our salary, we are going to walk to this team that will pay it. And that happened over and over and over again. It happened to CLG multiple times in multiple different places. And so, like, vis a vis, we all ended up paying $1 million for salary here, $2 million for salary here, when we are literally at times making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. That was that is the discrepancy of the teams, right? It was like it was like millions of dollars versus hundred thousand dollars. It was sick. It still is. And it's like I, I think like to just end this real quick, my hot take, you gotta and I know like people burn for this, you gotta cut salaries across the board by like eighty percent and then simultaneously fire fucking like people are like, So what's the solution? Just fire everybody? Yeah. Yeah, fire everybody. <sighs> like lit like literally. Like get everybody like 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 look at a hundred thieves, look at tech. That's what tech is doing right now, right? Like Amazon laid off 12, 12,000 people. That's what you've got to fucking do when, like, when the generals are there, when the, when the war horn is, when, when shit gets real, right? This, that's where we're at. Cut sale, player salaries by 80%. Like, imagine uh, imagine Riot yeah. having to lay off 90% of the staff. They're just the littered streets of Timor hats. <laughs> 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 like some sort of post-apocalyptic and, world. And just, like, <laughs> just like crumpled Kool-Aid cups everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so on, I thought on, they, I thought they cared for me. Riot Games. They told me they loved on, me. On the salary thing, though, I will say I, it's kind of interesting that I think um, I, I remember. Obviously, Noah Winston is sort of the progenitor, apparently, of the outrageous salary in LCS. Uh, that you know he activated some VC money, perhaps at a time when other people hadn't, and everyone blames him. And apparently, he was like, "Oh, you can just have a six-figure salary, yeah, no problem," you know. And uh, when other people were like, "Wait, do you not even negotiate with your players?" you know. And a lot of people blame him, but I, but I, I think those owners that do that are kind of telling on themselves a little bit because they've always denied that they were they would have conversations with each other about player salaries and like what their upper limit was and where they would go to and i know for a fact that absolutely happened like they, so they were essentially putting a soft salary cap which as recent events in the overwatch league have uh, mm -hmm. have, have told us might not be the best thing to do when you don't have a players association the government might frown upon that a little <laughs> uh the anti antitrust laws but um you know the 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 reality is there was always this soft limit that you could earn in the early days of lcs and just in esports in general no one was going to go beyond a certain point for a player i feel that once the vc money came in people couldn't contain themselves and uh, the team owners again this is and they just wanted to be like hey shit, I, I can just get an elite level korean i'll just pay them crazy amounts of money like why not and then i'll win and then i'll be the most winningest team because too many owners were treating esports teams like it was like their little fucking oh, well i'll never get to own the dallas cowboys but i do own tsm so let's yeah. be the most win and it's like it's a bit pathetic in retrospect and it's cost people where we are now that 80 percent of people that need to get fired that are all locked into housing contracts in like you know yeah. shithole apartments in la and and, and 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 they're in for a tough time the reason they're gonna suffer now is because of their fucking exorbitance back then Mm -hmm. That's the thing that, that pisses me off, man. By the like, way, if someone's a casual, understand that, like, like Devin said, how out of whack the numbers are as well. Like, I'll give you a yeah, couple yeah, of things completely. that were re really reported on things. Are all, these are all re legit numbers. So I'll give you one from CSGO, one from League. And if you understand how out of whack these numbers are, you will know this industry is almost irrevocably broken because this is just the lay of the land. So one, everyone knows every single year since about 2015, there's that story that magically gets leaked, Devin. It's weird. If I was someone who wanted to protect and I have a lot of money. I'd maybe want the story to be like, never mind, just a conspiracy theory. Basically, <laughs> that story gets leaked every year that Faker didn't take a deal in the West or China, but that was it, it, the number went up. Have you noticed that story every year? Right. And the yeah, number now, does, if right. people yeah. don't know, is 20 million. That's the number yeah. they now claim is getting offered yeah. each time for Faker to come. Right. If you know anything about what he just said, an LCS team makes $2 million a year. How could you? That would actually lucky. be, by definition, the worst deal anyone, if that team liquid ever did that deal for 20 million, I suspect, by the way, they just get a, pro a benefit of having this fucking story out there never having to pay anyone 20 million but if they ever did that would by definition be the worst esports deal ever and in csgo we had a similar one so this is going to sound really weird if you're a casual fan because you can go but he is a brilliant player that was worth it when g2 signed the young player monacy who at the time was a 16 year old russian player who had never played a single tier one land ever because the promise which look he has actually made good on was he was going to be the next simple he was actually sold for six hundred thousand dollars 
dollar buyout. Now you have to understand that's about the buyout simple should have, or like <laughs> Nico or so like top five players. Yeah. So already if you're gambling on prospects with 600 K, if you're going to pay 20 million for the best player ever, like none of these numbers make sense. Like that, that you can never financially justify those moves like that. that Cause these are just symptoms. By the way, notice that those two orgs I listed G2 and team liquid, that's supposed to be the good ones. Guys, these are supposed to be the like vaguely responsible businesses. So, like, what do you want if that if those are the leaders of the industry? You can see how we got in this position. And meanwhile, you've got Forbes and everybody parodying them. That's why I say it's a giant circle oh, jerk. Dude. Team Liquid, four hundred forty million dollar valuation. TSM, yeah. five hundred forty million dollar valuation. Right? It's easy to pay twenty million dollars for Faker because we're worth half a billion dollars, right? Yeah, I mean, remember yeah, Faze. Like, remember, I mean, like, remember, remember Faze. As soon the best as one is Faze Clan. Oh yeah, I mean, me yeah. and you were like, we're I mean, like okay, so, and shit, so I do have to, I do have to prep, preface this with the fact that unfortunately, what's going on with Faze right now really sucks for our industry because it's not. Let me yeah. make this clear: esports yeah. is like ten percent of what Faze does. Okay, yeah. Faze is an extremely badly structured influencer network where they have no exclusivity and people like and no real ability to sell across all of their various talent. Right? It is a very badly and they're also paying Snoop Dogg millions. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a very <laughs> bad. This is the most boomer uh, pocket of all time. But okay, right, okay, it is a very badly, <laughs> uh, badly organized talent company that doesn't actually have the power to get their talent to do anything. So that is what Phase is, and yes, they do have esports. They especially famously their Counter Strike team, but that is not why they their stock price is has bottomed out. It has nothing to do with esports and everything to do with no. their shit company. They, yeah, they're, they're, they're a shit media company, essentially. They're a shit media yeah. company run by in a, a, a midlife crisis, former music executive um, who is so insecure about his own background, he retconned history to say he was a founder of FaZe Clan when he absolutely is not a founder of <laughs> FaZe Clan. Shout out to my boy Lee Trink one time. He was, so, he was, he's a founder of FaZe Clan's horrible yeah. business uh, it, model yeah, he's, he's a founder of like <laughs> face clam llc incorporated like you know in association with I, I, wwe you know, you know you know i do believe 100 percent yeah. that lee trink designed and is a founder of their garbage business model but he was not a founder you know what, of the organization phase. you know what the crazy no, thing yeah, is correct. monty is that they like contractually if you've seen the phase clan contracts well like like man they can do and this is the only contract that i've ever seen that asks for power of a fucking attorney Okay, mm. like it is yeah. insane shit. I have never read Man, a contract. That, like, that feels I, so dark, though, bro, because that I feels have, like there's a like there's a Black Mirror episode where some it, face it, players is that. like you, some no, face dude, players like no, no, don't turn off the machine. The, they're, they're like we're just gonna have to you shut look this at it, down. They have they have headlines in their. I, I don't know how much <laughs> I guess uh, uh, they have headlines in their contract that are like easy, uh, like oh, I love my team and I would never talk bad about them. Then a vicious non disparagement clause is like for every time you do, it's like a cent yeah. on every word. They, like, dude, the I, I am telling telling you i work in an industry of predatory contracts i have never seen one more predatory than phase quit and it's not, I mean, even not close. enforceable though so, well not only, but that's the thing is that is that they have contracts like this that demand that exclusivity but they're so bad at running their fucking business that they can't even activate on them like, oh, like, by the like, way. Like, no, sorry go on that's it <laughs> so, oh, there's one thing i just want to throw in here monty which is this that's one thing monty that you just said there that everyone said for 10 years to justify all this bullshit behavior it's like well unless you take them to court what do you expect I'm yeah. going to bring up a story mm -hmm. I reported on recently. I did a video about XL basically ignoring German labor law based on what I was told and pressuring in a bunch of illegal and unlawful ways people to terminate contracts or just leave an org or just not say anything about stuff. Right? Here's what's mad about that example, right? Is in that scenario, Monty, it'd be fine if Riot did what they did in this case, which is I heard that when the pe when people went to Riot, like, hey, they're fucking us all. We've got contracts in your bloody global database. They're not even honoring. Like, they're saying we have to leave like our apartments stuff i was told riot just said to them like you should really deal with that in court here's the thing if you'd have said that from day one no problem i agree with monty this always should have been a thing where people actually tested the contracts for real took people to court by the way the best thing you can ever do but no one ever does this is why like industries like farmer are fucked by the way if you actually believe in the principle you should even try to win in court so yeah. it actually sets a precedent you have discovery now obviously everyone just takes the settlement and goes well i need the money because x and y happened to me and, and usually it takes decades for that to happen but if people People had done that right now either we'd have progressed to the point where people would actually try and sue people or more importantly it would be understood that is the course of action but that's the problem is in the middle 
We've had a decade of game devs not doing that. Every game dev took their little IP rights, like, like they were fucking Skeletor in the Last of the Universe movie, and they became the god emperor. My IP rights! And with their IP rights, they acted as though courts didn't exist. They acted as though we were inside yeah. League of Legends, their fealty. And they did stuff like, they fined you, Devon at CLG, if you did something. Arbitrary amount, no contract, no court, nothing. Just I, I, fine you, you know for X amount. I they would do things like, they would come in and say to someone, your team's coming to me. They would say, actually, you have to end this contract. Here's the thing, mate, Riot themselves should from day one have just said, go to court and deal with it. Let the law of the land do it. But they Riot didn't. So my problem me. is this. I'll just say this quickly. If you are Riot Games or Blizzard, you absolutely, right now, bear in mind, I agree, no one goes to court. You can do whatever you want. You could fix all these problems. You could just come in with some arbitrary rule and say, can't do this, can't do that. But they, it's like they don't want to do that either, mate. They're just, we're in some nightmare middle ground for me. Bro, we had a, Riot find me at Team Dignitas when I was running Team Dignitas before CLG. Okay, Riot find me because we had to have a coach on stage. We had so we we were we were we had a whole remote coaching thing done in Korea that was like really sophisticated. But we had to have someone stand on stage so they find me. So then I thumbtack a guy to dress up in a Big Bird costume and and he gets caught in the metal detector. Riot finds me again because I because I was going to have the Big Bird guy stand on stage to be the coach, right? Because we didn't need one on stage, right? These fuckers find you for everything. Fuck, <laughs> dude. dude I when, when I, when I was, for my when, when, costume. <laughs> when, when I when I was running when I was running Renegades, so I was at the LCS studio, and uh, Susie, my wife, who is an OG esports personality, yeah, awesome. was a yeah. literal Twitch employee at the time. So what happened was um, we were we I was I had gone back to the you know the Renegades room backstage to to talk with the team and stuff like that, and unbeknownst to me. Noah Winston, who was friends with Susie, was like, hey, do you want to, you know, come backstage with me? And so she went backstage with Noah. That is line, was she, it? Fucking God. It, <laughs> she, uh, she, took a, she took a selfie with Piglet, who's a player that she knew from being in Korea. And, yeah, you know, get, your, get your picture with Piglet, everything, baby. I know them all. Because <laughs> no, Piglet had just moved over to NA, and she had, she had talked to Piglet. She actually helped, um, you know, with the Twitch deal, the original Twitch deal between T1 and Twitch. So she knew okay. the players and was on good terms with them. So she just said hi and, like, took a selfie and posted it to Twitter. As a result of this, um, they claimed that she had not like backstage, like she had not been allowed access backstage, despite the fact that she was with a team owner of a different team. And I was a team owner um, and that she was creating like illegal media backstage by yeah. taking a selfie with a player. So what they did was. In spite of the fact that I had nothing to do with this, they pulled a press badge, like a content creation badge, from both us and Immortals for the entirety of the split so we could have fewer people filming backstage as punishment. And then they reported her to Twitch, which then got her, like, got, Twitch, like, was like, right, it's crazy, you know, ignore this. But they tried to get her in trouble with her employer. Yeah. It's fucked up. The culmination of that story with the, uh, like, I ended up having to stand on stage. And I, so I would write in a notebook and hold up signs like Riot is holding me hostage. Like, please. And, and like, uh, we ended up getting, like, just for that entire story, I ended up getting fined like three or four times. It's <laughs> just for that. Whole thing. <laughs> but that money, they would find us all the time for stuff. In, in, um, but the point, I guess, like, the point here is that, like Thorne said, they had carte blanche, right? And like, maybe, hey, maybe you could have taken one of your 500 project manager toads or whatever, and you could have yes. put one yeah. on like actually going to the TAA and being like, hey, Hey, what are the implications of us running this talent? And like, what would this look like? Let's structure something and get something like, like rather than like have to force people to go to court or poor Tifu yes. going up against the, the the monster of FaZe Clan <laughs> only to be uh, obliterated basically in legal fees uh, and have to settle, right? Like, wh why not actually do some kind of preemptive work? And to uh, and to Thorin's point, well, because they wanted to be the full blown rights holders, they they own the IP, they want that to be their fiefdom. Yeah. I mean, here's well, a bigger point, though, that I think we have to make because it connects the two problems. Like earlier, it sounded like these team orgs just can't catch a break, man. They're getting fucked and losing all this money and they're paying everyone off. But here's the problem. What I essentially just pointed out there was when it's the player against the team org, though, you're shit out of luck. Because in this scenario, either you go to court, you don't have the money and the time to do that as a player, or you hope Riot step in and then they do it as the game dev, right? That's the problem. What I'm essentially also pointing out is this. The same team org owner 
that complains about all the problems doesn't point out that essentially in that equation, Riot is on their side. Like, right, I always say this, in the modern day, until it ever makes any money from real ticket sales, the customer of the LCS and the Overwatch League is whoever bought a franchise slot. That's who the game dev's dealing with. Like, you're the person who's paying the money, mate. They have to keep you happy. They have to find a way to keep you in the league and the ecosystem. Like, it isn't the fan. He doesn't pay him anything. They already own the game. They're making all the money we've just said as a marketing adjunct off all the esports shit. So to me, that's another problem we have is like, team owners need to decide what are they? Are they a separate entity that's all about their business and making money? In which case, stop colluding with Riot Games and public devs like that to fuck your players when you want to. Because which one is it? Are we going by the law of the land or are we going by game devs gods pick one and we can uh, make some progress we can't sort of half do both in my opinion that just ends like this where it's like the wrong people get fucked all the time you know yeah i think it's interesting yeah. as well because like you know the one thing i've i've come to realize about games developers um you know which, which like i say that they are the most sort of odious people to like interact with like get, get games developer executives they're on another fucking planet like these silicon valley types microdosing at lunchtime you know thinks they all think they're geniuses and it's like why because you paid some dude to make you an app that blew up like fuck off you know you've got like 99 misses and one hit but that one hit was enough to make you a you know billionaire and, and turn your company into like a fortune 500 whatever the fuck uh, i i hate the developers because they think every slot they think because they own the intellectual property for the game they think they're entitled to a slice of every single fucking pie that comes out the bakery because of that and it's crazy it's like i mean look we all know the story now that I told at the time of Activision Blizzard calling up Twitch when they got bought like by Amazon for $970 million. And Activision Blizzard were like, congrats on the deal. How much of that do we get? <laughs> and Twitch are like, well, none. <laughs> uh, about zero. And they went, what do you mean? Our games, our games made Twitch, like World of Warcraft and Hearthstone and all these other accidental hits that we made. <laughs> you know, like, uh, we don't get any of that? No. And then they immediately we're like okay well we'll buy our own streaming company and we'll put all our fucking games on there that's how they were able to finesse the 90 million dollars for two seasons yep. of overwatch exclusivity deal yep. so um yeah. you, mm -hmm. you know but but it but it's also i know from talking to team owners games developers have even said when these like crazy valuations come in on forbes like you know you're worth like uh you know let's say i think it was tsm were like the first one to go above 500 million dollars and riot games are like going you know yeah like, congratulations you know you're basically valued on our video game like yeah what what what, what else is tsm if not a league of legends team and, and we all know the mark merrill story love me some reggie it's it, it it's like it's the the crazy and, and also i think more tellingly when mark merrill said to i will dominate you know when he said to dom uh congratulations of having a career on the free game that we made they truly do believe that all roads yep. lead back to them and i the, the, the only way we break that paradigm and I've talked about this before as well, so apology if it's, if it's a broken record. But you know how, like, in media, there's, like, a fair use exemption clause? Like, if I take a clip of Devin's video and I narrate it and add some commentary, it's protected. Even if he wanted to take me to court, mm -hmm. like, the chances of him winning and stopping me using it would be very, very slim. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, the, what What is a fair use exemption in esports? When mm -hmm. can I fairly use intellectual property that belongs to a games developer to say, oh, I don't know, run a tournament, and what kind of content can I create around that, yep. and how much can I monetize it? And if you look at every other type of media, you know, music, movies, TV, uh, books, there's all fair use exemptions. It gets the intellectual property with video games and suddenly Nintendo can shut everything down. They can kill an entire eSport if they want to. They can stop you talking over a video game trailer. Well, you don't even and, get the fair use and, exemption for that. And here's know? the thing, here's the thing, Richard. I mean, it, it, basically we are hoping that there is some sort of landmark court case that is going to yeah. decide We've been hoping issue. that for years. That is what, ev by the way, guys, behind yeah. the scenes, that's what everyone is fucking praying for in this industry is that there is some sort of court resolution that is going to put this to bed and allow people to open it up because the thing is we already know what happens when you have an independent tournament organizer operating an esport it's called ogn and uh, nbc game and it happened in brood war in korea and we know factually that independent tournament organizer organizers can be profitable without having any kind of relationship with the developer and they can do it and sustain an esport over a decade plus period 
We've mm. seen it. It's already occurred. So it's not a mystery because We've the thing about We've also got OG another one called ESL, though. So, you know, let's... <laughs> well, ESL actually does have relationships with the, the publishers, though. That's the thing. Yes, um, yeah. Famously, because of, you know, obviously because of uh, what happened with, um, with Brood War was that they didn't have that relationship. You know what I meant? That was the whole thing that when yeah. Blizzard tried to like claw it back and they basically shut down Brood War in Korea, that was the entire issue, which you're not going to go into here, obviously, because that's an entire other can of worms, basically. Um, but yeah, I mean, this was this was one of the central problems. And but we already have the the evidence of what happens is that OGN was able to independently operate. And because OGN treated the leagues as an entertainment product and as a sports product where they had to sell sponsors in order to survive because they didn't have this secondary flow of skin money that was coming to them. They had to figure it out how to make these things profitable. They had to do real development of the players into superstars because otherwise they don't retain viewers and they have no money and all of these things fucking happened like it, it's it's in the past so we know it can be done hmm. by the way if you want to know some group of people like we're talking about people bitching in the west who all make millions and have great life if you want to know the people who are the most angry at the lcs it's fucking korean team owners they had that shit on lock homie they had the best players in the world making like 20 grand a year might not even get a cut of any of the prize money and forget about sponsorship. That's our money. And they not only had that, then they had Kesper sitting on top of the whole thing, controlling everyone from the top down. All the deals were done with the TV channels. And essentially, if there hadn't have been this weird foreign market, essentially like what MLS did in like soccer, where you, you, people will just exorbitantly pay more money for an, a wash pro, they never ever would have had to give that control up if China and LCS hadn't existed. So the joke is we even infected and broke their whole fucking system. Because if you don't know, the reason why Bruce Brood War ran so well is it was like the most ruthless version of the NFL you've ever seen. As in, yeah, the big star, he gets mega paid. Flash got $300,000 a year. But the guy who practices against Flash might make like fucking $10,000 a year and he does yeah. the same amount of practice. Mm -hmm. And the point is, they, the way they were able to pay the 300 k as I always said this, Brood War was amazing for what it, it, it did in terms of games and stories, but it was just a machine that ran on broken lives of young men and their dreams yes. in it career. That's all it, did. it was terrible. Yeah. I always used to say it. I actually used to have a moral qualm watching it because it's like the UFC. I like the sport, but I don't like the idea of people are getting fucked up and hurt and someone's doing it for 20 k and you know he's going to ruin his whole life. Like That does tear you apart a bit. So the other thing about this is this is a problem that again like all financial things it's all tied in across the whole world as well like one thing Monty said earlier if you missed it was how could viewership in, on league in some ways go up but then LCS is dying because it's all Chinese viewers and so unfortunately everyone yeah. in this channel we're in connect we're disconnected from a Chinese view they have no relevance to whether our business succeeds whether the viewership so to me there's another problem we have in esports is we, it's not just America it's not oh. just LCS that's that's like sort of I mean, fucking well, and we can't run ads against it's, anybody in China it's not only that it's not only that sure but yeah. here's the thing. Um, even LCK this year had its highest viewership without counting the Chinese viewers ever. And a lot of it was English mm -hmm. viewership and a lot of it was Korean viewership. And the thing is, is because it's a better league. And and the thing yeah, about League of Legends... Know, the English viewership is almost as much as Korean viewership of the LCK final. That's it's crazy. inexplicable wow. as that seems. Yeah, That's nuts. So, but <laughs> here's, here's the thing. At the longer an eSport goes on, the the more the the fans are going to be hardcore and like continue to gravitate towards the best games. And people long ago learned that NA winning was a delusion. And so mm -hmm. if you don't have an affinity to the players, and again, the teams have done a very bad job and the LCS historically has done an extremely bad job of building up new star players to replace the ones that have retired or have gone away, then you don't have any affinity and you might as well just watch the best gameplay, which historically over the course of League of Legends has happened in Korea. And also because the LCK broadcast is much more accessible to a Western audience than the LPL broadcast, right? So these are all factors that really contribute um, to the overall success uh, of the LCK. And it has a prestige about it that just doesn't exist with the, the Western leagues or the LCS at this point in time. So it's not surprising that fans want to watch the finals and that fans really want to watch that league. There's also a lot more gameplay, so they get a lot more viewed hours. But for example, this last season of LCK, without counting the Chinese audience, had 70 million viewed hours. And yes, it's on five days a week, but that is, the LCS is 14 million. The LCS is 20% 
of the viewership of LCK now. That's insane. Yeah, I mean, but but also as well, it's like, I know, I, I, I kind of feel that it comes back to we never really took any like stat or like you know no appreciable measurement of just how big the industry was yeah. we always found a way to kind of like obfuscate like the actual size of the industry because we were always worried about it appearing smaller than it actually was because how would we attract you know big companies big corporations to come and invest in the scene and so when when we talk about all these numbers you know it's like I, I just feel like we're, we're we're out of the type of lie we can tell anymore. This is why- Good, this, that's that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. but this is what I mean. It's like, you're, you're living in a world where, like, cause this is gonna make 2008 look like a fucking cakewalk, by the way. Like, this is, this is real. This is all of the house of cards coming tumbling down. Not just one or two elements. Cause you remember after the 2008, you know, subprime mortgage crisis, all the problems we had in esports there, we was, we were rebuilt and in a golden age by 2010. New games, new tech, you know, that's not coming this time. There is no mythical fucking like ladder gonna unfurl from the clouds to pull us out of the dystopian nightmare we're going to be locked into in esports it's simply not going to happen this time so yeah, I, the, you, you think we're going to get to the other side and and, and the people who are left are going to be able to rebuild something i'm telling you it it's for me it's just over it's just uh, esports as you know it is dead it cannot come back it will not recover from this it will never attract mainstream interest until we hit like another tech landmark or something like vr or the fucking what the metaverse or you know whatever the yes. fuck it's gonna be esports as we know it competitive video games in stadiums you know that's yeah gone. That, it's, it's that dead. Part of it's it. over it's over I no one's coming back for that anymore I think that I think that franchise leagues that is and like what we know as esports is like the mainstream esports is gone and there's there's a nod to be paid to like stuff like FGC which still has a pretty vibrant community even though it's taken a hit with stuff like Beyond the Summit closing down and some of that like pretty tragic shit in Smash but there are still esports and esports teams that are running lean and authentically in those spaces there's a lot of good shit going on in like Rocket League there's a lot of good shit going on in like uh, like traditional fighting games and I think that is where esports was always kind of supposed to live right and it, one thing that I, um, whenever we have like sort of the esports exploding talk that like uh, I don't even bring up enough is collegiate. Like collegiate's still really healthy, and, and a big reason why collegiate makes sense is because it can be a small portion of a university budget to do an activity that students would already otherwise want to do. So collegiate is like really good, and, and, and so this as like what Richard is saying is right. Like like this mainstream idea of esports that we've all been kind of collectively. Uh, circle jerked into believing, it, my, my, myself including everybody, the teams, everybody that is Im implicit in this, um, is gone. And, 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 and I don't think has a real role and maybe never really did have a role. It was kind of just waiting for that shoe to fall. But there is still a, yeah. a, a niche of esports, a passion for people that want to play competitive games and show that off that is still there that can actually be really sweet. I just think everybody needs to set their yeah. expectation to yeah, that exactly. level. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. that, and, 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 and that's what's going to happen. It's like, listen... You know, like it, it, it's gonna suck if you remember the glory days. You know, like if you yeah. were there, if you were in those stadiums and you had those moments and you worked those events. You know, like we all, we've all had those moments. Yep. We were, we were blessed. We were there when esports peaked, right? Like, mm -hmm. we, so you know, wonderful memories. We'll treasure them forever. And I don't give a fuck if esports goes back to a bunch of dudes in a barn, I don't, huddled I, I prefer around it. the fucking monitor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like that's mm -hmm. what we. The problem in esports, as I said, it gets back to the point. I made earlier there were a bunch of somehow the money men the the grifters got in and we like we didn't notice and then the people we trusted to be like the gatekeepers and like custodians of the flame they all betrayed us they all sold us out the, the, all of the team owners all of the guys you're like hey you came up with me you were legit right no they all were looking to fucking offload and sell and so they would listen to what the corporate suits were telling them to do with esports yeah let's all wear a shirt and tie why our demographic doesn't dress like that yeah but you get on tv like that bro here you go really overdo it now we're on tv hey now we're in stadiums look they're buying hot dogs they're doing just like a real sports and like in the yeah. back of your mind you, you're so excited about it up front but in the back of your mind if you're old school esports you're thinking why did we actually need to be any of this again looks like there's a lot of 
cost going into this looks like this is a well, bit the bigger reason, than we the ever needed is, to again, be it goes yeah. back to it goes back to the explosive growth and the publisher support of the franchise leagues because the people who invested in the VC were basically told that they were going to have they were going to be owning NBA teams by now you know this yeah, is for this sure. is yeah. You know, this is what they were sold. And so the reason why people are bitter, advertisers, VC, you know, the investors, um, is because it's not the NBA. But the thing is, it never needed to be the NBA. You're not going to, you can't look at me with a straight face and say that the LCS can't be profitable with 100,000 concurrent viewers. Like, absolutely it can. Of course be. it can. Yeah. Right, let me, of course you, it can let me get, do a quick history lesson here, because there's a bigger point which goes like this. This is essentially, Richard's right, that phase of esports is over. Like, if you missed yep. it, then just like any classic scam, so prime housing mortgage is a great example, like yeah. stuff yeah. like stocks and insurances exactly. in the 80s. Exactly. Like, essentially, there's a reason why they will one day make a movie that'll be like Wolf of Wall Street, but it'll be like an esports movie, and it'll yeah, be obviously a shit version. Yeah, but the point short. is, you know how in those movies, <laughs> yeah. there's always that vibe of like, nah, you missed it though. Like, that, what, like it, was, it was up until this day, it was all going, and then it's over. Like, it's criminal, legislated out, no one could do it, everyone has to move on to a new grift that only just ended now in esports because if people don't know the original grift of esports this is when esports became fake is exactly what you're talking about esports used to be literally grassroots land parties that yeah. become bigger yeah. land parties that become a circuit by having a bunch of land parties like the champion plays the former champion it became like that and then what happened was instead of growing as a grassroots thing which it would have done for like 10 years would have taken a lot longer but it would have been an amazing business by the way you could have even built it up like at the land people start to pay to watch the fight you could have seen how all these things grassroots could have been built up. Instead, what happened was all the legit people in esports, all those people who are in the halls of fame now who were from the 2000s, I've got bad news for you, they were all the con men. Now, part of it was they were conning themselves, but this is what they used to sell to those people. And when you understand this, everyone in this call will know what I'm talking about. All they've done is a just slightly more complex version of this for the last 20 years with more real numbers and more variables. It originally went like this. You would say to someone who was investor, so it started, by the way, with the tournament organize it the cpl and wcg they would go and get millions of dollars in budget for these events like i want like five hundred thousand dollars to run a couch strike world championship and what you do when you go to this company like intel remember there is no esports at the time that term doesn't even exist you go to them and you tell them this little powerpoint presentation that everyone's seen a version of you go right you probably don't know you think it's just your grandson playing video games but look here is and everyone knows the dreaded metric i'm about to bring out here is the entire movie industry that is $2.3 trillion <laughs> yeah. dollars in the world. And then they go, because well, this is already like late 90s, early 2000s. They go, you're not going to believe this, but this other bar graph is the entire gaming industry. And you know what? The gaming yep. industry number was always bigger. So if it was 2.2 trillion, I give a random number there, obviously, that suddenly the gaming one would be like 2.8. So yeah. suddenly the boomer guy goes, holy shit. Do you mean it's bigger? But what they haven't told you, which they conflated was... They did all of gaming, bro. That was like people buying Mario and PlayStation yeah, and fucking yeah. streaming. <laughs> what they didn't tell you was eSports is the competitive version of some of those games. And then actually, that's not even true. The competitive part is like, let's say like 1% of the whole game. And of the 1%, 0.1% of the 1% is esports, and that's actually what I'm selling you. But I'm going to pretend I'm selling you the 2.8 trillion. I'm actually selling you, let's say, 50,000. But I want a 500k to run this event. Now, what happened was the early people to take those deals, the Intels and the MDs, they weren't idiots. You go and look at the prize pools. In two or three years with the same TO, they just slashed the budget in half, and they realized, holy shit, I get all the same stuff for half as much. And in fact... Wait a minute, where's the rival coming in that's offering him more? Holy shit, they have no leverage. So already, that's why TOs didn't become the business to be after the first 10 years. Suddenly, everyone wanted to be a team org or the game devs came in. So essentially, that approach has just been a more and more complex. And I can tell you, I've seen modern decks. It's the same thing. It's just with better graphs, yeah. just with better I fucking numbers, with more examples you can give. And the real problem, I'll tie it to what Richard said, is part of the dream was the reason you need to access this market is once you do, they're basically just the next sports and you can do all the usual playbook which as we've seen doesn't work they don't buy tickets they don't wear your merch they don't really give a flying fuck about anything that isn't free the broadcast well, rights don't exist except one time when it was thing. when it was an enormous scam that has now killed yeah. broadcast rights forever yes. and instead now every broadcaster twitch mainly just goes wait a minute i have all the leverage suck my I dick <laughs> and everyone has to <laughs> take it and bend but, the but knee so to bring it all back thing. here's the here's problem the here's the problem there is a way out of this devon but it isn't what 
what you want, mate. We're not going to go back in the DeLorean and do it right and save Doc Brown and just build grassroots. Here's the problem, mate. You knew where this convo was going. What we're going to do is there is a greater fool. They're called the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Qataris, Abu Dhabi, <laughs> China. Those people, by the way, you know what? They're like the game devs. They've got a golden goose. They've got a fucking guy spinning up straw into gold. They've got unlimited money and all they want. It's not a big deal. It's just to influence all of your values and thoughts about them and the world. So that's the deal. Do you all want esports? Do you like League of Legends? Basically, if you just let countries and foreign governments and regimes that kill people on a daily basis over human rights, if you just let them control your mind, you can have Bert Jensen on his $2 million playing Holy against Bjergsen on his $5 million. And there we go. Brilliant, brilliant industry, right? Yep. That's fucking dystopian as fuck. I never really even thought are. about that. Outcome. It is though, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, it yeah, is though. Like, <laughs> like, well, I, yeah, I guess I had hoped that we would. So, I mean, like, because I was about to do a whole speech about how, like, well, the real, the, like, the real death is the passion, right? But like, if you're telling me that this cycle is just going to repeat itself, but in China it and in Saudi Arabia, out, it turns out that you know buying horrifying. in right now is gets cheaper and cheaper. And if well, you have a lot of money, sale. brilliant. <laughs> if you if you if you have a lot of money, it's a good time to consolidate the market, especially through a recession. ESL just bought Esports Engine. So that is another tournament organizer that is, you know, now under their ages. And but remember, these Monty, are... these guys don't even know how to hide the leverage. Like TSM are so dumb. They will actually announce to the world that we've made an incredible deal with FPX. Then when everyone in the world knows FTX is eating its ass, they go, that wasn't even a big deal in our org. It's like, which is it? That, that doesn't even make you actually just like essentially just invalidated your own existence, you moron. Because yeah, but that's the fucking orgs, mate. That's the world we live in. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, 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 it's an amazing time, especially through a recession. The the companies that can be most successful are going to be the ones who can spend their way to the through the recession in order to yeah. grow their influence in the market. And who knows what's going to happen with some of these esports teams that are for sale? Well, right I've, now, already, right? I've already I've already told you, brother. It, like this is how the yeah. There's a lot of motherfuckers out that want to buy the dip for sure. And again, I, this is what I mean about esports being over because now all of the things that we used to that used to matter in 2016, you know, things like competitive integrity, conflict of interest. Like, remember when I used to write an article and shit used to change that day? Like, announcements from, like, you know, games developers <laughs> and stuff going, well, well, this, now that this has been brought to our attention, we've created some rules and it will never happen yeah. again. Now I write an article and everyone goes, yeah, it's esports, man. Dude, it's, it's worse. Evil. Nowadays, what they do is they <laughs> go, nowadays, yeah. Rich, the same people before who were like, we've got to, like, riot in the streets because they haven't done this one thing. Now they go, well, yeah. human yeah. rights, you got to yeah. You gotta break you a few eggs. Compromise. You know, so, I know it's so here's, it. here's what's gonna happen. Like 100. Um, these entities that are coming in. By the way, you know, I have been told the Qataris are watching what the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is They're doing. They're watching this um, stream right now, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I won't say it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're a big fan of my work, I'm sure. Um, but the 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 thing that uh, is uh, you know going to happen, uh, organizations that are in the toilet like phase where they're now because they went public because that was the last desperate clamor, the last grift. Let's go on the stock exchange. That'll save mm -hmm. everything. Uh, you're now a penny stock and you're about to be delisted. Uh, I think this private ownership idea could really turn us around. So anyway, th what's going to happen is like, you know, they've got $43 million left of liquidity that they say will keep them operational till November of this year. And they have to say that publicly because it's in their SEC filings. So uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, or, you know, like a, a, an, 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 an organization like that, an entity like that, they're going to come in and they're going to start buying up the orgs. And then the orgs are going to compete in the leagues that they own. And then and, and and it's going to be broadcast on a streaming platform because I bet you dollars to donuts, by the way, the next play ESL is making is they're getting a streaming platform, 100%. Um, that's I mean, you've seen that's the so, push from Blast, right? I mean, the yeah, joker, yeah, yeah. Blast, you do realize, everyone Richard. Wants some, everyone well, wants the receptacle for the also, content now. I mean, Only content you'll appreciate this money. reference, right. by the way, Richard. But the yeah. actual real joke of all this is Nicola and I hope was the visionary. He <laughs> actually did have the game plan. He, he did. He was yeah. the Quisant. He was the demiurge. He was, he was trying he was to rule the world. Evil Quisant. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> but, but, no, but, uh, I mean, but yes. Riot, by the way, Richard. Wait, 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 Richard. Richard. Just, just, wait, wait, wait. just finish. Just finish. And, and then, so, so you're gonna end up with 
or like how MLG originally tried to structure, but again, back then, nobody really cared, and they will own, FaZe brand will just be a team that you slot into. No more buying into a franchise league. Hey, look, we'll just give you a team. We've got one. You want to come in and be the FaZe brand in this league that we're running? Because we own it, and so why not? And it makes sense to have them play because we've got a bunch of subsidiary businesses we're running off that. That's what's going to happen. Like, oh, it's going to be as close to WWE as as you can possibly get you'd licensing you know you're the undertaker you're john cena john cena's own name is owned by wwe right like phase will be owned by esl you know for example so mm. that's that's what's coming because they're the only people with any spending power in an all-time desolate low low bar marketplace and everybody wants out they will take any money that's coming it's the only thing that's going to save them it's the only so, thing that's going to just i, I have questions right. like because because like so like what i i it's a very dark thing to think that we're all just going to be big chilling on some like platform in like in like two years. Oh shit! Yep. But like, like the publishers like Riot, uh, they're going to keep control of these leagues, right? So are you saying this is going to happen at a team level? Are they where like they basically? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. That's an assumption. No, you no, don't no, know it's not. that. Uh, they, they they will because we just had a whole talk about how the the, the marketing budget is well, not the marketing budget. They make tons of money off skins. Of these, but what if they, but, but what the if the they find somebody to absorb the cost of the league while doing his, all of the marketing? Ten cents already. Ten cents already. A hundred percent stakeholder in about in relating to the games developer. Go look at how much Saudi equity is owned in Activision Blizzard, uh, in in Riot Games. It, you know, uh, it's it's they they are going to essentially buy the developers or be in such controlling points. So the very tip Microsoft of the buying Activision Blizzard, similar yes, thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, but I mean, I don't mind that so much because I'll sort of take uh, American corporatism over uh, tyrannical oil regime. I don't think Microsoft gives a shit. Yeah. Or, or ownership, you know. So, so, but what's going to happen is if you look, and again, this is happening literally now, like they're increasing their position in almost every major games development company. They know now that esports is a sort of, for them, a desirable industry. Well, what? Why? Because of that demographic we talked about earlier. They Saudi Arabia are looking at it from the viewpoint of job creation. Remember, they want to become the Silicon Valley of the Middle East. And mm -hmm. one way to do that is to have desirable jobs. How do you create desirable jobs? Well, you own a desirable industry to work in. They've mm -hmm. got like an unbelievably young population by comparison to most demographics. Saudi Arabia and those kids want to work in esports. They want to work in tech. And, and they want to work in games development and other cool shit. This is why they're buying it all up. They're buying up entertainment it's not just like esports it's like esports is the little fucking polyp that is growing on the side of the entertainment industry and saudi is coming for it all and so the games developers will be saudi influenced if not owned outright because they'll have to like you know hold on to a little piece of their american identity or whatever the fuck then the their esports division which creates content. That's all esports ever was. It was just content. That's now going on their streaming platform that they own. It's being put into stadiums that they actually own the real estate on. And then uh, 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 with teams competing that they also own with players that they also pay. It's going to be this sort of like sick freak sideshow where it, it just is wrestling it's just going to become professional wrestling it's just going to be content without by the, the way, yeah and by the way when the influencers start coming and they're owning the orgs which you haven't even talked about yet and they're going to want to slot in with the saudis because let's be real they all talk a good game when it comes to ethics but they probably won't actually uphold any of it when they see the astronomical projections for profit like they're only human at the end of the day well influencers understand the importance of sort of curated and created and content contrived content almost more than anybody else so bang that's just gonna slot in hey you're like you know you're like disguised hosts esports team want to do this like fucked up heel run through a league where the games don't actually matter bada bing bada boom coming soon two years do you feel like do you feel like tencent has um mainly done a okay job of kind of stepping away from riot and letting them do their shit i mean like i, I don't i don't get the oh, feeling no, no? No, I mean, because they didn't. Again, it's the illusion. And I know they like, what you have to remember is they were so furious about the way Riot Games was being run. That was why they essentially, uh, they they bought up the remaining control uh, shares. Mm -hmm. And they immediately pushed, like, Mark Merrill's out there, like, swinging his dick around every day, like, tweeting, like, fucking shower thoughts for 14-year-olds or whatever the fuck, like, trying to look like uh, one of these visionary gurus. But he's mm -hmm. completely shelved inside of, like... 
you know, uh, inside of Riot, all of that D20 management structure are. They're just waiting for the tap on the shoulder and the massive golden parachute payment. Mm. And then they'll go and start, they'll create a startup, which will fail um, because they're morons, essentially. So, I mean, you know, Tencent said to them, like, all of this loss leader stuff, we really need to, like, stem the bleed a little because you're doing ridiculous things that aren't making us money. We've got the biggest esports product on earth and we're getting this tiny little return from it. That's not going to fly in China. That's not how we do things. Um, so no, I, I don't. I, I think actually, probably from a monetization perspective, the ten cent taking over Riot and saying we actually need some dollars and cents instead of all this like stupid virtue signaling, lecturing, Riot Light era. Well, the game needs to be a conduit to make you a better person. No, it fucking doesn't. It needs to make me fucking money. So shut the fuck up, you know. So <laughs> so uh, also does as a yeah. game. They objectively do the opposite. It actually dehumanizes yeah, you, yes, makes you yes, like yes, an animal. It, or something it turns a feral animal, yeah, of course. So, so I mean, look, so I, I actually think what Tencent did has actually improved Riot as, as a business because, you know, the Chinese uh, priorities are very different to an American company's priorities. I see. Yeah, I actually don't really have the data. Like, um, that's one of the things I'm kind of curious of is, like, these I, – I know that these, like, big – uh, organizations are absorbing these publishers and stuff like like Microsoft and Activision. I'm less worried about Satya's fucking building Gigabrain AI. Like mm -hmm. he's got other shit to worry about other than like you know whatever Activision's doing. Such a small division. Um, Tencent, uh, like they own so much of the gaming industry. I think people don't realize like, if you take the top ten games on Twitch, like over yep. half of them are owned by Tencent. Grinding your games, for example, Path of Exile was, was one of my big yep. games that I play a lot. Totally owned by Tencent. But as of yet, we've seen like no change in like the microtransactions or like the attitude of that. So I, I I'm curious curious how um what like like i guess like what i wonder is and i'm not denying anything i just i just don't know this as well but like when we talk about like saudi arabia and then buying like someone like esl right like who is they is it like what like 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 who is a uh, public is this investment like a fund so the saudi arabian mm -hmm. public investment fund is basically a, a a fund that they use to go out and, and sort of increase the cultural capital of saudi arabia around the world mm -hmm. primarily in entertainment and tech uh uh franchises and sports as well so esports is a very nice little you know convergence of the three but they own pieces of disney Uber, yes exactly and, uh, you know yeah, Uber, very popular apps and tech stuff like like that so um you know what what they want to do though because obviously i'm sure you heard of the practice of sports washing what this is really about for them is this uh, other than the job creation aspect i talked about which is very important if you're a tyrannical regime and people are getting ideas above their station like to have freedom for example well how do i fucking placate the populace well here's a bunch of cool fucking jobs with benefits and you're living in this world you know it's very easy to create a utopia if you're willing to be tyrannical essentially so so the, forget that shelve that for a second what they're what they're trying to do with this is like the third stage of sports washing this is like sports washing used to be we run a tournament um you ignore the evil because you go hey they're just like us for real for real bus in no cap then stage two of sports washing was actually we are going to buy existing properties so we occupy more of the cultural landscape phase three now is we have got all of those things we bought so addicted to saudi money that they cannot function so if mm -hmm. there is any pushback on anything we do anything we say anything we believe we just turn the money off and we kill them stone dead and by the way they'll walk away from any of these projects they'd walk away from formula one if they let too many drivers wear rainbow helmets they'd walk away from the golf if uh you know the, the winner came out as gay and said fuck saudi arabia you know when they want to all they would walk away from these things in a heartbeat but they know none of these things will happen because the money is too, too influential yeah and and, yeah. and that's mm -hmm. exactly what's going on in esports it's why i laugh when you know brian ward from the savvy gaming group is saying i would never partner with anyone i have a daughter and i would never partner with anyone that would oppress my daughter well yeah. tell that to the fucking millions of saudi women where it's like it's being heralded as like some sort of great cultural revolution because they're getting uh, rid of the rules for like male chaperones in public uh, for certain age groups.
you know, like these things tonally do not connect. And unfortunately, this is why, again, Saudi Arabia is playing and Saudi Arabia and these other oil producing nations to a lesser extent now with the war, the Russian oligarchs, obviously as well, Chinese business. They're not playing with the same deck that the rest of Europe and, and, and America is right. They're not they're not playing with the same set of rules. Mm. They cannot be held accountable. They cannot be enforced. They have more money, more spending power, and they are doing it for reasons that we can't really sort of conceptually grasp because that's not why we go into business. That's not mm. why we buy things. And so unfortunately, again, a big fra it's not really related to the business side of esports, but the big fracture in esports is, especially from co a competition standpoint, how can I ever enforce anything in Saudi Arabia or how can I ever enforce anything in China? How can I stop match fixing? I can't. I can't. They won't recognize our authority to punish any of the punish any of the players, but I can do it to an American. I can do it to a European. But how can we have international competition when we've got these two very different worlds that don't operate in the you know the, the hemispheres? We don't really. You know they don't tessellate they don't connect so so for me just to bring it back to the business side of things the, the problem is there is no stopping the saudi arabian takeover there's no stopping the qatari takeover it's already happened in sports by the way they own they're buying all the premier league you think that european super league that everybody shut down you think that's not happening in two years of course it'll, it'll, eventually it'll be, they'll get it up through, it'll be all the oil producing nations yep. that own these teams and law play in a league yep. and law be televised and all the rights will be sold and it'll be money hand over fist and it'll be the only place players can play and the premier league will be a husk of itself yep this is what's happening in esports. We, 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 I can tell you what's going to happen in esports with a lot of confidence because it's already happened in sports, basically. By the way, just as a random piece of trivia, Devin, like this isn't even just we're speculating. Like literally, the Saudis wanted to buy into this company, me and Monty's company, for really? millions of dollars. Now we said no because we're the sort of yeah. fools who you won't see in two years, and we go, won't we? But obviously, like everyone else would probably just say yes, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll probably you know? be in a be in a suitcase. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That. That's a. That. This is context I really never even thought about. I mean, it's. It's so macro. Um, by the way, there's an angle you can tie it into. Like the other, another angle, like Richard pointed out, there is. It makes everything we do in the West so stupid because we can't actually universally apply it. So I'll give you an example, Devon. In the same world in which we're all going to pretend that like Carlos can't make a tweet about someone people don't like, but who who he isn't. That's like the end of the world, and we have to like wreck G to the org. He must step down. He must announce it. There must. Be, but at the same time. Time, we can all be in an ecosystem that funds Riot Games, which funds Tencent, which then directly, you can look this up, enriches the economy of China through the Chinese Communist Party. That is, lit You can look this up. What happened was, like, two years ago or something, Devin, they made too much money at Tencent, and they said, right, you have to give us a bunch of that for the country. Yeah, like, yeah. We're acting but, in a world where people yeah. want to pretend they are ethical about their decisions in the West over tweets, but then yeah. we're all just going to do things that tangibly help literally like raising it, his arms. It's, 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 it's even more know. absurd than just it's wild, that isn't it? Because, because Carlos's direct replacement was the guy yes. who, while at Riot Games, <laughs> negotiated the Neom sponsorship deal. And if you, for those that don't know, obviously, Neom is a futuristic city, a technological revolution, where we're all going to be able to travel to Saudi Arabia and do haram things, and they don't care, and it's just to make money from us, you know, Western tourists. But it's literally being built on stolen land. And I don't mean in the abstract, we're all co we were all colonial powers at one point. I mean, literally, they stole it like yesterday, and they killed the uh, head of the tribe in a very weird standoff where they said he had a gun and it turns out maybe he didn't and and so it, it's like th th we're in two worlds and and unfortunately this is what this is why I'm so pessimistic about the industry I'm not going to I'm not going to take a sort of sidestep and go, ah, it's bloody complicated. This It's not complicated. Human rights have to matter. That has to be the line. That has to be the threshold. If you want to be a human being and you want to operate with a basic level of empathy and you want the world to be a better place, like, let's just start with human rights. Let's just agree that that's the thing that can't fall. Everything else we can negotiate. Let's start there. Well, unfortunately, they don't believe that. They don't believe these things. It's, fundament it's fundamentally incompatible with what we wanted to build when we started the esports journey and they run it now hmm. they run it now and they will they are going to run more and more of it by the end of the year and by next year i it's going to be essentially what? a sand pit for tyrannical regimes to play in in the same way that 10 years ago it was a sand pit for wealthy americans to play in
Let me just make a quick point here because there's an example in league that people are going to think is the exception that proves you can actually make change. And it's obviously the Neom deal. Do you remember the Neom deal, Devon, where all those LEC casters bravely Mm. stood up and put their jobs online? Here's what I'll tell you, a little prediction right now. When that happens, but it'll be 10 times bigger, it already happened in CSGO, by the way. We know the way this one shakes out. When that happens and it is 10 times bigger, the deal, not only will nearly all of those people say nothing, they will either have to never work in League of Legends again or completely violate what they did in that precedent. And here's mm. why. Because I don't know if you saw Richard's actual reporting on that topic. Obviously, you can't get on the League of Legends subreddit, but you can go look it up. Richard was able to find, when he found out the behind the scenes of the Neon yeah. deal, that when these Americans from the headquarters came to the LEC, they pretended like they came in like, whoa, 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 you sit over here, you sit over here. We've got to sort this out. What's going on with this deal? And then what they did was when the talent left the room, Devon, they just went up to the people who were from the European office selling these sponsorships and they said no this was fine this sponsorship deal is actually totally fine you just messaged it badly which yeah. essentially means we're timing. going essentially means we are going to do this in the future so what people don't know is in CSGO we had a microcosm version of this what happened was a bunch of talent the same thing happened with Neon they were going to sponsor Blast and a bunch of the talent came out and said I won't work with them while they do this right spoiler since the same people behind Neon bought ESL all of those talent with the exception of one person I'm aware of Vince, and even he sounded like he cracked recently on Twitter. They all work for the same company now because what happened was it was a luxury to turn down one gig, but if the choice is, do you want to work in the industry? They all say yes at the end of the day. So unfortunately, I feel like I've seen the way the chips fall on this, mate. It's just when do these entities come and put enough money through the doors that everyone just turns the blind eye and does what we said earlier. They go from being the most hypersensitive people to where you got to kill a few thousand people to make an omelette. That's world we're going to be in and what and for what so i can watch faker do something on ori and soul like i don't know about you guys but like i actually want something more when the devil buys my soul like that's not enough for me like faker <laughs> dancing in front of the fountain that really ain't enough for like eternal damnation i'm gonna need more than that you know so what um so what happens like like what happens to the viewership and to the is this a like the end result of this is a loss of passion is it just like we kind of just like going through I the don't cards think or it like impacts on uh, the fans at all devon because unfortunately yeah. one of the one of the yep. side effects of sports watching is obviously the normalization of you know bad people owning mm-hmm. things that you care about and you just get so worn down with it i mean like think about how jaded we are right and like i think g- genuinely if if we were to sort of strip away a level of artifice we've all at various points been you know in love with esports and enchanted oh, with esports absolutely. and really wanted it yeah, really absolutely. wanted it to go somewhere good Good, uh, even though it didn't in the end but the, but you know uh, the, the the problem you've got is like how do right disney own everything for example so mm-hmm. and saudi arabia owns a piece of disney so mm-hmm. if i c- consume disney media you know if i want to watch the simpsons now for example i love that show you know now am i what level of complicity uh, am, am I, you know, at what level is it? Is it 1%? Yes. Is, do I need to be at zero? And, and, you know, and there's this jaded kind of mantra among Zoomers these days where they go, no ethical consumption under capitalism as if to sort of say, well, we, we shouldn't make informed choices about what yeah, we Yeah, by the do. way, if people don't know what Richard's talking about, the joke is this. That's, that slogan is supposed to mean that's why we all have to leave the capitalist system. Yes. They now use that as the justification. Exactly. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah, the exactly. modern Zo- Here's what's dark, Devin. None of the modern Zoomers give a fuck, me. I can tell you from English yeah. Premier Football, which is the one you need to look into because it was bought up by all these entities. It has the opposite effect, bro. What happens is this. I'll use Richard's favourite club. Richard's football club in the Premier League is Newcastle Football Club. And Mm. famously, they used to be owned by the old model, a really rich businessman. But because in the modern day, you essentially have to be a loss leader as a football team. You have to spend money out the arse on the best players, like LCS style. You're just playing crazy figures and you're buying someone. Well, you're not buying them for a million more. Like The reason he comes to your team is you just offer twice as much to his team and so they have to sell, right? So you get all these players in and I can tell you, if you're the little fan growing up in Newcastle, Castle now, and you probably have obviously never looked into like who is Saudi Arabia, what are these funds? All mm-hmm. you see for real, dude, is this is the best time ever to be a Newcastle fan. We're yeah. getting all the money through the door, we're getting all the sick players, we're gonna win the champions. You you actually think it's a positive just across the board. If you never look yeah. into it, the sad thing is the experience for the viewer might actually get better. That's the darkest part of all of this.
yeah and 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 that's and that's what they're relying on if if, if, if the fucked up thing is with with a degree of control that they'll be able to exert where you know uh, now was saudi arabia and again i keep using the pif but they're not alone you know the pif can say with games developer let's make this game more esports focused that's actually put the things you're talking about into the game why not right because it behooves them because they own an esports league they own a streaming platform they own a content content platform they own the teams they own the players they own every little aspect of it and so actually from a sort of again that that macro perspective in terms of monetization it, it, it could it will be a promised land it'll just be a soulless <laughs> promised land that's built on very awful things in the background now mm. a lot of people can be at peace with that you know like me and me and christopher have had this discussion you know like he he says every dollar's got fucking blood on it and they all spend the same and if you start making the decisions you're gonna go fucking crazy and that's a perspective it's not one i share but it's a perspective that at least i understand how it makes sense you can make sense of the world if you believe something like that the, but the, the problem is things will probably become better for the fans things will probably mm. become better for the owners and the entities that stick around just in terms of a pure content and pure monetization perspective but it will not be esports it will not be the thing that we felt when we first saw it in stadiums and in fact there's an even dark aspect to it where it's like there's something you can pick up on when you're in a stadium of people applauding because they're gen genuinely into something and a stadium mm -hmm. of people applauding because you can't see the people with AK-47s just out of your, your eyes. So you mean we're actually going to enter the world where it's like, Comrade Rioter, I noticed you stopped applauding for the speech of Mark Merrill there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we're actually going to enter that world. Put <laughs> it, it, it this way. <laughs> You will see, and we're already seeing it to a lesser degree with like other odious politicians. Like I don't like Macron, but obviously you can't compare him to like a you know Crown Prince Ben Salman or anything like that. But they're already starting to use esports in the same way you use sports. You put yourself adjacent to you know you got Macron walking around in a Vitality top, and everyone's going, "This is amazing!" No, it's the politicians are fucking it's mad, scum. isn't it? Like, isn't that mad? All like, the fans what? were loving him for one yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, you know, like uh, fuck this. Like so, but but it's a matter of time before we get a clip where it's like, a, I'll use North Korea because it seems like a ridiculous example, right? But it isn't. It's coming. That, that'll that be coming too. Um, but, but, you know, you'll see like a North Korean dictator, whichever, you know, whoever's in, the glorious leader, right? And there will. There'll be like a little esports tournament being played and he'll be like applauding someone getting a very fake, you know, ace uh, because it's all bullshit. That's coming. Mm. Like you'll see that. You'll see that in two to five years. Wow. Where a, well, a, a a dictator uses esports to sort of go over with the kids. I I think, and you know, the reason why we got here is the same reasons you know to, to kind of connect all of these things because these are future predictions about what's going to happen with the industry and also present realities of the industry after uh you know because of Riot's ownership and because of ESL's ownership, but it's also that you know the reason why we got here was because of all the factors we've talked about. It yep. was. The developers hiding the money that was made from this industry so that and they weren't sharing it and they weren't being reasonable with it in any kind of way. So then the teams ended up having to load up on venture capital, which now they are paying for that the bubble is bursting and audiences, the viewership is down and the things that they promised it, it's not the next NBA yet. You know what I mean? And maybe someday it will be, but not on the timeline that the, the investors are demanding. So now they're pissed off and the teams and, and the leagues did not provide value to the advertisers so the advertisers are all pissed off and there are no media rights because at the end of the day even though and i can tell you this riot has been working on a streaming platform for years at this point in time and they've had a lot of problems with it and so it hasn't come out yet maybe it'll come out later this year or early next year but they have been working on it but the problem is is that they didn't they didn't care because they were making so much money from the marketing exercise of the game that they didn't feel like they needed to make the teams profitable or have media rights deals that they could share in or you know have competitive platforms with Twitch. And so they were happy just to give it away to Twitch and YouTube for free for the most part. And then the one media rights deal that was done with Overwatch, um, we found out that esports fans are not willing to subscribe to the channels in the same number, like the same percentage that they would subscribe to an individual streamer. 
right? Mm. In fact, nobody was subscribing. Like You don't subscribe to the LCS channel. You don't subscribe. You don't use your Twitch Prime on that shit. Nobody does. So how is Twitch supposed to make money? Like, at, at, at some level, we've talked about this before, the fans have been complicit. You guys spend zero dollars. You don't spend, you don't buy subscriptions to the, 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 the tournament organizers' channels. You don't spend money on tickets. You don't buy merch. You don't, you, you have a fucking conniption when somebody says maybe you should have a pay-per-view for five dollars for the major i mean the joke can see as gold on tea is they'll actively try and sabotage the tournament if they don't like something yeah. about it they'll try and encourage everyone <laughs> not to watch even though it's free <laughs> That's such so, by the way the one the one controversial take not obviously the one we've had loads of them but the one controversial <laughs> take that did age super well with me and duncan was being the dissenting voice when the Facebook deal happened with ESL. Yep. And we were going, yes, Facebook sucks as a platform. And they're doing this. They're using that experimental budget Devin talked about earlier to see what works and what doesn't. Um, but it's really good for the industry that we can sell broadcasting rights, people. And even sure. Valve came yeah. in and fucking stymied that and said, no, yeah. uh, the, the, the ESL have a responsibility to be on a platform that our players approve of. Like, what the yeah. fuck? don't they're running a separate business it's not mm. there but for the grace of valve for fucking go i you know uh but that but that aged really well because like you say Devin, there's never going to be that type of broadcasting rights deal done ever again and i don't even the, you know, yeah I, I don't even think there's going to be any viability of new streaming platforms or anything like that like um there's a, a whole discussion that esports uh, twitch and like the live streaming industry is taking a lot of similar L's that the, that the esports is. I, I don't think that something like an ESL run or a Riot run streaming platform is going to even translate 20% of the viewership that they currently yeah. get on these platforms that have first mover advantage. Don't see that happening. Uh, well, like, man, like a lot of uh, platforms took on, like, like, like YouTube took on esports and didn't get that kind of transition. And that's yeah, like a really well known platform, yeah. much less one that doesn't have users, you know? Yeah. They're going to, we're going to get what we've got in media consumption. Where you know how like you remember back in the day you just had a Netflix Netflix subscription and that was that right yeah. and now it's like I got Netflix I got Hulu because I yeah. like the old HBO like, Max like yeah, yeah, I got yeah. HBO Max mm -hmm. now that's just called Max for some reason I got a Disney that I bought when I was drunk so I wanted to watch one episode of The Simpsons you've got all of this stuff and it's like that's gonna happen in esports I think and it's gonna be what's yeah. gonna be super fascinating is how much of the developers get of that because you know if I was ESL and I know. I, by the way, as I said, I'm calling this 100%. I made a lot of bold proclamations on this episode, but 100% they're going to buy a streaming platform or build a streaming platform, and it's absolutely coming. What Blast TV are doing, ESL are going to do, but wow. bigger and better yeah. and shinier. That's all. I mean, but, but here's the know. thing. The ideal scenario would be for ESL and the game publishers to work together mm -hmm. to build a streaming platform that offers one subscription to all yes. of their esports, yes. and the oh, revenue yes. is divided according to viewership. Yes. Unfortunately, that is the best plan, but it will never happen because they will well, never just all the said, publishers won't agree even on if it, it. Did, yeah the problem is monty yeah. it relies on the mechanism of sharing which is like yeah, nuclear fission <laughs> like <laughs> it's, if that sounds yeah. fantastic but has anyone ever yeah. done it do but, I, know, but, I, I mean think? like that's if, the only way i think to get money out of the media rights if is you for all access, of the if, to every single like esl tournament you know this from having like ogn subscriptions but imagine being able to go in like chronological order like because the vod curation even on a youtube channel is a pain in the balls to find a specific game at a specific date specific time it's not actually very intuitive to find like yep. it certainly isn't on twitch where it's just like if i want to watch a game i have to go into a nine hour vod know when it starts Let's click on a oh, fuck this it's a nightmare now if you yeah. give me a curated like every game ever played in every esport in every tournament esl's ever run and also a bunch of additional shoulder content all of the documentaries that they filmed new yeah, documentaries, like the f1 app new yeah exactly dude like that is a fucking gold mine but as duncan says the games developers are gonna go ah we kind of made those games that you're showing behind that paywall so what are we gonna do and they've never yeah, that's got why they have to own it, it now yeah exactly yeah, that's why so. they have to own it so the only way you could do that is for them to co-fund do a joint venture and co-fund a company that would split up the revenue according to the popular titles but the thing is you need you know you you'd have to have activision blizzard riot esl yep. um epic 
you know, all Valve, all of these companies working together on this project and agreeing to what the rev share splits are going to be. Well, that's what and the then, at that point thing was going to be right. Oh, by the way, yeah. Monty, since you referenced it earlier, one thing I can say as an actionable thing that someone could do who's watching this stream right now is if you want to be like so, what, like the equivalent of that guy from the movie, like the fucking insider where he like broke the whole like tobacco industry open and what was going on with the marketing and what they knew and didn't know. If you want to be that guy, here's what you do. You actually get the information from a game dev like Riot Games or Blizzard about literally what the margins are from the esports side of their whole business and how it relates. And you give it to someone like Richard Lewis. If you do that, you could actually <laughs> blow this whole thing wide open. You'll also be dead. You will literally be in concrete shoes, dead, with the face, all that shit. You will literally, by the way, for real, so you'll be give dead. Give it but, to me. But, but at the same time, I would appreciate it, basically. You know, well, I, you know, I think the problem, I think the problem with that, even that concept, <laughs> is that I think that the knowledge of those numbers is probably limited to a handful of people at any given company. So it would probably be very traceable is the other, is the other problem. You know, how many yeah, people know what those nuts. so fucking go yeah. for it. I mean, but but like how many people know like at Riot what the actual profit level of esports is like 10 maybe? Maybe? Yeah, I mean like really high tier executives like um the, in the agency world we just know the ad budgets and the returns that they get and then only on the deals that we do and like uh, th there's I think there's probably the most amount of sophistication about like in terms of where esports is making money in terms of like how the ads are doing and sponsorships and like spoiler it's not good. Uh, but like, yeah, from a perspective, like what they're actually making, man, like that's like internal company data, no shot. The only um, thing I don't like yeah. about this combo though is we've done that thing again. It's like what we did to Nicola Niom and CSGO Richard. Like they end up, if they're watching this, they're like wanking off of how cool they yeah, sound. Cool. Like I we're know. making them, <laughs> like this whole episode's basically just right the whole time. They see me rolling. They hate it. <laughs> right, they yeah, don't exactly. give a fuck about us. Yeah, exactly. That's, I what I, that's why they, that's why they are it's not so incentivized wack, to make skins for the teams because <laughs> they could either make a 100% of the money or less than 100% of the money. <laughs> That's what Why I even love more. I just love, I just love the way they don't even pretend to share though. They're just on that logic of like, yeah, but then how would I only make all the money though? And you're like, no, no, I'll make you a lot of money. Like, yeah, but then I wouldn't make it. I'm like, fucking hell, yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> can I get in on this? Like, nah, it's my game, innit? Like, sound <laughs> brilliant. Why is that a thing? Because well, by it, the way, it, I can actually give you a tangible example. Look, probably I shouldn't speak about this, but spoiler, I don't sign NDAs, so suck that dick again, right? You might not know this because I've only said it a million times because I'm the only person in the industry who gives these disclaimers, but I actually own stock in the company that made ProView for Riot Games, that app where basically it shows you all the clicks on the screen. So instead of just watching the VOD, which is actually quite bad in League, if you don't know, if you don't see where people click on, you can't really gauge like, the reaction time and stuff by how the movement. You could actually watch famously like Faker play and Bjergsen play and they didn't have it in China or whatever but they had it in certain regions right now I can tell you you can imagine a product like that basically can't lose money by the way after the development you got the tech it's just do enough people pay the subscription I can tell you it was like a healthy little cottage industry mate it was doing a, doing a good job it was making money for Riot and for the company that I invested in now look I'm not like a main person that's why they even were probably willing to do it they didn't know I waited until it was already going before I made it public I was involved with it right but basically all I can tell you is the the reason why that essentially seems like it's a canned project that they've done, this will blow your mind, mate, because this is another example of where in esports, there's the groups over here that are starving, and there's people here just scooping whole plates in the bins because they don't feel like that flavor. Riot's whole jip was basically like, you know what? Bit small fry for us. Not really that much money. Shut it down. Yeah. Because it wasn't theirs. They didn't make it all. So... Essentially, what I've just told you is they had a free spigot that someone else was pumping the water in, just giving them free water. And they were like, nah, I wanted a whole pool full of those. Just close it down. And when you live in a world where game devs do that, that doesn't just show you're not willing to share. You're actively against the idea anyone else is ever allowed to <laughs> succeed. Like that, yeah. that mentality ends in either you own everything as the God Emperor or the whole thing's ruined. Like eventually, mm. we all have to cooperate. So eventually, there has to be some level of human cooperation to accomplish anything. And that's why we are where we are. <laughs> <laughs> we got um, there, boys. I, I, I was gonna do a little segue at the end because, like, because okay. I, I, I didn't want to end on a pessimistic note because we always do. And you were totally right and on point. And here we we just had forty minutes of doomerism because we always go there. <laughs> uh, but but obviously <laughs> Devin isn't quite as doomerish, and I know you're not. And I don't actually know where Duncan is on this. I'm like, just to I'm on totally on the outs. I don't even care. Like esports, fucking. Yeah, you, I won't, you, I won't you, any you're black filled all the way down. At this yeah, point. yeah, fully, fully black filled. Yeah. So, um, so I, I thought we could end on like, okay, esports as we know it is dying. 
but what does the new wave of esports look like and is there anything to sort of look feel good as, about as, as i said with the clg acquisition yeah, like awesome. CL, yeah. clg was a, was a shambling corpse of its former self you know it was it was a zombie inhabited by msg and everybody who was like oh yeah uh, you know <laughs> uh, i really it's so sad that this brand has gone i'm like motherfucker the brand died like six years ago where were you you know, yeah. it, it's a name and it's a it's a bad name and it's a bad logo and it has none of the appeal that it used to have. And like Madison Square Garden clearly didn't care about it. But for me, having somebody like Andy Miller involved in the scene, Andy Miller rules. And so, like, I am much more excited about Andy Miller owning an, an LCS slot than I am about Madison Square Garden. So I think the upshot from all of this and why I said it's not necessarily a bad thing is that there are going to be a bunch of operators who genuinely care about esports, who still want to be involved in esports, who understand the current stakes and understand the current growth. They're not deluded by what's going on. And so if they want to be here, they really want to be here. And frankly, I miss that time of the industry because when it was a lot more fun when people really wanted to be in the industry and were super psyched about it, as opposed to when all of the charlatans and grifters came through looking for the next big buck and trying to blow this up for the largest possible payout. When that, when that delusion is over, we're going to be left with potentially a bunch of actually very likable people within the space who really want to continue to do it for its own sake and don't mind playing a long game. Like eventually esports is going to be bigger than sports. That is inevitable. I don't know what that timeline looks like, right? It could be as Richard, you, you said earlier, it's going to take probably a very big leap in technology, whether that's VR yeah. or holograms or a, who the fuck knows, right? In order to make that happen, it's not coming soon. That's a, that's abundantly clear, but that's okay. Like I did not get involved in this industry because I wanted to be a billionaire. I wanted to do it because I love esports and I wanted to live a, you know, a comfortable life where I get paid a decent amount of money. And that's still possible. As I said earlier, it's not impossible to have a profitable stream with a hundred thousand concurrent viewers. We just have to be better at doing the things like, we now have to actually solve the problems. We have to solve the problems of inflated expectations. We have to solve the problems that we have been so shitty to sponsors in, in terms of providing value. Yeah. You and have to buy the freeze pipes at the freeze pipe.com. Yeah, LFN, the, the cord pipes. for 10% off. <laughs> it cools over 300 degrees this morning. Yeah, the I, fans have to be educated that they need to start paying a certain amount of money in order to enjoy the products that they enjoy, just like they do in every other space. The developers, if they want to continue to have teams, are going to have to increase their revenue shares and be more honest about the money that they're making from esports. You know, you don't think the teams right now are going to all the devs and saying like, pony up motherfuckers like we're we're struggling and we are going to leave by the if, way monty if, just to tie this into what we were discussing earlier that's also why people like tsm i think have done a very stupid job with how they've marketed their org because they marketed their org the whole time with a disingenuous conflation that they're just whole org made money and they tried heavily to imply it was the lcs and league of legends team making them some of that money but then all of a sudden they themselves can be like but we don't have any money to run it's like you just said a minute ago you had all the money like that's one of the dumbest well, things ever like essentially well, one of the things i never understood about tsm was this by your own logic if you actually look at the books you've just tied a really healthy business to a fucking one that's dying that doesn't even make sense you should have split yep. them if anything well it's also like I, you know we can, we can get back to when sponsorships made sense in esports you know i do believe that in 2010 evil geniuses was providing a lot of value to monster i believe that was true because yeah. that, that relationship lasted for over a decade until the current eg idiot executives hosed a deal that was one of the longest term partnerships in Western esports history. And so it's some monster well, didn't, did it, did it not turn out as a good thing for monster when they found out Danny's diet was like two Marlboro lights and a fucking white monster each day. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's, but like the point, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, the point is that, there goes our monster sponsorship door. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the point is, is like these these companies did find value at some point in time um, as a result of these deals. But that was when esports was a lot more sustainable prior to the explosion 
of you know ca venture capital and investment interest in the space. And I think we can get back there. I really do. And it was honestly way more fun when that happened because when teams were reliant on having good content and good personalities, we got fucking in control in Idra. Like it ruled. It ruled back in the days, mm -hmm. guys. Like when when these teams were actually, you know, trying to make money or at least breaking even, we got all the big personalities from the early days of CLG and TSM. It was more, I'm just telling you, if you guys weren't here, it was fucking more fun. It was way more fun. Uh, and that's why we saw the big growth, growth in viewership. A, a big part of it is esports just isn't fun anymore. So the fans tuned out and now they just want to watch like XQC sleep on a mattress on the floor, which is... Yeah, but in many ways, more entertaining than most esports. I, I'm going to be I'll, honest. I'll, I'll say a few things, like because I, I think there's two real positive things coming to esports and to gaming and to live streaming that I'm really excited about. And I, I think the first one is a little bit of what I talked about before, which is that I, I do think that recessions force us to look, at, to Monty's point, force us to look at the what's realistic and will as a result, get us back to some of the grassroots stuff that we really enjoyed about esports because a lot of these kind of big investors that don't see the ROI and the return will actually leave. And and, and like maybe they'll be replaced to Richard's point by like even greater demons eventually. But I think for the in, in the short term, and always there will be pockets of esports that are really exciting, which kind of brings me to my second point is that um, I'm lucky enough that in the agency world, I get to see a lot of the technological developments that are happening on stuff like Unreal 5 and stuff that's like happening in the, in the gaming industry, the development of GPT to be used to help supplement code. It, it, and I think what we're going to see is we're about to see an era where very small teams can produce really high quality shit in gaming. And you're in the next like three to five years, we're going to be able to see games that would have otherwise taken teams of 50 to 100 developers be produced by literally a fraction of that. And as a result, we're going to get a lot more variety in competitive gaming. And there's going to be a lot more of those stories that are going to be able to be told because there will be legitimate developers that are like, yo, we're actually going to run this thing above board and it's going to be fucking cool. And, and, and so I'm really excited about that because like there may be contenders that like maybe an empire can be built on honey uh, from from some of these developers that come through and technology makes us more enable to do that because you don't need millions of dollars of venture capital people pushing or breathing down your neck saying give me a fucking five five x ten x return or 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 we're or, or putting it under you might not need like the great uh, shadow government that says like here here's the billions of dollars maybe a team of three to four people can make a compelling game off of the Unreal Five engine or something and well, and, and then and, and then put it out there and I'm really excited to see like that future that's cool here's an interesting take the new Fortnite creative suites the new creative tools uh, that Epic has built, um, all modern esports, every single one of them came from a mod created by a user of a different game. Yeah. yeah. That's, and they mm -hmm. all came from it. Like MOBA mm -hmm. came from that. Counter-Strike came from that. Um, you know, th these are these are things that we know works. And so the more tools these developers offer, like what Epic is doing with Fortnite Creative, um, could birth a new esport, right? And yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, fucking Roblox has games that are like as sophisticated enough to be esports. Like, like we're gonna get to a point, and I think we're already quickly getting there, where I don't know that the stranglehold that these publishers have is going to be as dramatic as it is today. That we're gonna get to a point where, like, uh, I mean, this is a really interesting thing going on with a game called Dark and Darker right now, right? Which is like like a yeah. very small studio that's split off from Nexon that is uh, that is basically building a game that people kind of want to play. It's a it's an OG sort of Tarkov medieval type of simulator that is that is fun as fuck to play and. and it's a very small studio that made that game. I think we're going to see a lot of that happen where we have these like these these groups of like five or ten people get together and go, you know what? We're fucking sick of it. Like we're going to we used to work at Blizzard. We're going to go make something that is has ARPG elements. I think we've seen that with StarCraft right now, right? Isn't there isn't um the people that made yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. StarCraft, aren't they building their own RTS? And then we also saw that with like one of my favorite ones is Hearthstone, right? Ben Brode went off and made fucking Marvel Snap, which is a fantastic game. Right. So like this is stuff that I think I'm really excited about in, in the esports industry. I think we're going to see a new level of competition that comes from the, these games just by virtue of the ease of technology and access. So I'm fucking pumped, boys. <laughs> all right like like you, you we'll, we'll give we'll give over all the og stuff to the shadow governments and the okay they can have it all right like let's let's get into the the new era of small grassroots esports. i mean that probably is going to be the next gold rush like um you know people trying to make a game that they have total dominion over like an esports org you, you know what i mean something like that that'll, that, that'll probably get 
They'll probably roll. Are you being hundred Davis? Yeah, well, <laughs> well they, I, mean, I mean, shit face. It's the right? real joke. You guys aren't thinking on a higher level of resolution. <laughs> what I would do is this: I would make the next esports game a game where you have to like Sim City manage an esports ecosystem, and you have like a team, <laughs> or and then essentially I'd let the greatest players ever play the game and figure out if they ever find this is a solution. <laughs> or in the end, do I, you just have, the joke is though: at the end, if it's really hard, there's just an option where you just sell out to the Qataris so, at the end of that. So, so yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Basically, you're doing like Ender's game. The yeah, exactly. Edition, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know what's uh, you know what's interesting we didn't talk about is that you know every single like major team like a hundred thieves and them are all pivoting into something completely different other than esports. Yes. Like CSM. I think they're going to websites now, and then obviously hundred thieves is doing their energy drink. Well, they were I wonder websites, where yeah. all these. Yeah, By that's the way, true. I mean, they're, they're going you know back. What, Devin, yeah. I'll give you a little yeah. freebie here, mate. Here's, here's a little bit of canned material for you. But I am just going to say, how's no one else made this joke? Right, Nade shot. Think about who Nadeshot is, guys. Think about the cerebral capacity of Nadeshot. Think about the sort of background he comes from, maybe his education, what hobbies he's into, what sort of a person Nadeshot would have been. Like, he maybe could have made that claim a lot of people do in documentaries. You know, if it wasn't for the games, I'd be, you know, in the streets or I'd be in prison. All I'm going to say is he launched an energy drink for his fans called Juvie. <laughs> Brother, that's it, too on the nose. It, that's it too on the nose, Nadeshot. <laughs> it frustrates me quite a bit that these <laughs> same people, the same, the, the same owners who were like expounding all the like amazing stuff to investors are now like making the clips on the podcast today. Like, well, it's an unsustainable business model. We, but yeah. you know, that, that is a very frustrating thing for sure. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I, also, I, mean, like, I, 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 I love, I what love how, these, how dis, uh, about Nate shot. I love how disassociated he is with reality at this point in time, where he thinks that because he loves golf, everyone else must love golf. And so he's now releasing like a hundred thieves golf apparel. I'm like, Really? Yeah, who, is, yeah. who is this for? <laughs> uh, uh, the thing like, that, I, it's great that you love golf, but I, I don't think other people like golf in, you know, who are your fans as much you know as you crazy, like golf. This, real quick, the crazy story about 100 Thieves that um is, is really interesting is like, you know, that apparel, like maybe three or four years ago, would have sold out in, in, in under a minute. Um, like, 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 no matter what they released, they were yeah. literally doing merch drops that they were like three or four. Like, Nate shot when he's on his podcast, and we were five, six x in our revenue every single. But he's not lying. Like, that really was happening. And, and I, I think what ha this is this is actually a really cool thing. It, it's not cool, but it's like really cool to talk about. <laughs> um, you remember when Team Liquid had their uh their content series? When Team TSM had those content series and everything, all of yep. these teams got to the point where they felt so fat in their light and and so secure, they stopped giving a fuck about narrative. And as a result, yeah. now I, I think if, if Hundred Thieves does that drop, they, they get nowhere, right? Like, I, I, like they like they didn't realize that while everybody like like uh, to your point, like where XQC like lays on a bed and he's cool, he's there every fucking day for sixteen hours creating that shit. And now all of a sudden, when all these esports teams stop doing content, they stop telling that story because oh, we're good, we got millions of dollars, we're fucking we're fucking solid, right? Now nobody cares. And you go onto EG's Twitter, you go on a FlyQuest Twitter, and you look at three retweets, and right, like 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 five hundred K followers, three retweets. The engagement is fucking crazy low. Yeah. So they, like people lost the plot. They 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 didn't, they didn't care. And nowadays, those same merch drops would just be like, like wash them, man. You you gotta keep that the, stuff in the shop. The thing I really hate as well right now is this trend of like all the bullshit that like influencers do to make money. Um, which they totally lie about, like it, it, the way it sort of washes downstream like sediment and it comes into esports. Like we're seeing these fucking ghost kitchens, you know, because like Mr. Beast, I've, I've opened a fast food franchise. No, you're using ghost kitchens, homie. Like, let's, let's, be, let's be real. Like it, it's a kitchen where like Subway and McDonald's and everything gets made there and you've just done a brand and call it Mr. Beast. But they're doing that in esports orgs now. I mean, and there was like, that woman from the 100 Thieves had that brand with the makeup thing was the same thing right wasn't she essentially just her her name went on someone else's product or something yeah i mean that was like that was that was something different i mean that was like i don't even oh, understand right, okay. the reaction to that because it was like yeah it was an existing product and it was like she got crucified for basically like bad science which the whole beauty you know oh, beautician sure, yeah. industry yeah, yeah. promotes you know the blue light concept yes. that, that was ridiculous but but anyway yeah now they're making like you know i like there's a fucking thing i covered it on my stream you can get a phase sub Right, and it's just made in a ghost kitchen, which does like five, six other outlets in one building. They're super awful, predatory businesses in general, and they force legitimate businesses off uh, apps where you order food. 
But because Mr. Beast did it, now everybody's got to have a fucking sub. You've got to have a sub. You've got to have some type of fast food in esports. And it's garbage. And they put these statements. It's just like everything's just a roll of the dice. Like how much more can we milk this shit? And it's just pathetic. Like I, I like if I was external to esports now and I was like, let's say I'm a billionaire and I got money and I'm I wouldn't invest in that. Because you don't know what the fuck is going on. You, you 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 just try any trend to fucking milk the fan base. It's why, by the way, I don't hate the fact fans don't spend money on esports in esports. I don't hate it because they've been burnt with everything, man. Like as soon as Kickstarter happened, everyone got fleeced on Kickstarters. You know, as soon as like Sons you know, of Starcraft, never forget. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like I was there. I watched it happen. Right, like the fucking pizza GG pr thing that predates even that, and then it was Kickstarter right. scams. And and then yeah, that that's a deep cut, Richard. Yeah, dude. That. Yeah, totally right. And then it was like okay, and then you you know crypto scams and NFTs yeah. and all this, and it's just it's just like every it's exhausting. single yeah, yeah. So if I'm if I'm yeah. like an esports fan, why why the fuck would I want to spend money on? Are, are you burning me this time? Oh no, it's real this time. Is it? It, it's real is it you really do care about me this time you, you know like fuck this it's just like the industry is just like i know man it just it, 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 there's no coherence to it and everyone says that every the next thing's always like the best it's always super cool it's always amazing look how great it is i can get a phase sub that was made by a company literally how dystopian this done can you'll appreciate it the people who make the phase clan subs it, virtual dining concepts that's the name of the business. Oh, it's so authentic. Oh, it's so it's like fucking beam me up, man. Like you know, there's, uh, a, there's an interesting concept in, in in marketing. I think about a lot where, like, um, if you look at this Path of Exile League, for example, for people that know, don't know, it's a it's an ARPG that uh, regenerates new content every three months. It has a new season, and there's new content to play. Um, it, it's widely considered by like older players to be the worst league of all time. Um, like Crucible is like really difficult yeah. to play. Um, and I speak as a person with four thousand hours in the game. Like I also feel that way. I I quit the league in three days, and I never do that. And the reason I I bring this up is because um, despite that, Crucible had fifty thousand more concurrent uh players than it than any other week beforehand. And, but more importantly, the rate of recidivism, the, the rate of return for those players is higher than any other week. Now why would that be if it's widely agreed to be the this I'm gonna tie this to esports in a second, but like why would that be? Well the concept is Diablo 4 came in and a lot of new people got interested in the ARPGs. And now here's the real important thing. This is the coolest like what really cool thing in marketing. To those new players who are now playing Crucible for the first time, this is the best that's ever been. Because they have no context into the back of it, right? So in the exact same way, in esports, when you come in as a new person, to you, this is like the fucking business. This is a cat's pajamas, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. The, 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 the problem really is um, that esports has failed to really onboard a lot of new users to keep that hype train going. Right, it's mostly kind of like now it's the four old forty year old bitter vets on the podcast, and we are the the voice, right? Like like instead of like the new blood that's come in and says, "Hey, here's this why this is still interesting." And in the exact same way that like if you look at like Twitch, for example, it's declined in the number of total streams over the last three to sixty five days. It's declined in the number of total viewers that have been watching. Right, that that new blood isn't being properly adopted to keep that narrative going. That this is the new kind of cat's pajamas. So everyone just ends up being bitter vets. <laughs> You know what, by the way, if even though this would be actually so annoying if they did, unironically, if they were smart enough, people like Jake Lucky should just do sort of a counter version of this show. Just every time we do a topic, just like two days later, do your own stream with like three people or your version of each of these, bit Hunter Grooms and all the other. Well, and, fucking, I've, and then the joke is you just do how it's the opposite. It's all great. It's all awesome. But they, they can't because <laughs> because up. ultimately <laughs> what we're saying, what we're saying about this industry is right. I mean, like the, if there was all of these new reasons to be excited, there'd be people talking about it because that's how oh. fucking hype works, right? Yeah. So like, ultimately, when you don't create these narratives and you don't create these interesting storylines, all you're left with is the, the old guard and, 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 then you, and the truth, which is like, it's, a, it's stale. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I know Wait I out. keep threatening to retire every time I feel a little bit sad. <laughs> You've retired like six times. I know, yeah. it's like, it, it, what a fucking joke, right? But like, <laughs> Richard's 
10 one last rhymes. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It's like, the, I only like, want really, to... this horse won't buck me off. Something yeah. pisses you off even more than last time, and you're like, oh, damn it, are you going to come back? Uh, exactly. Exactly. This horse, Not, this this horse like, sucks too. Why I am I on the floor again? exist in esports just because it's like, look at that fucking piece of shit over there. Look at what they're doing. Uh, go on then, go on then, yeah, go on. We'll do an article on them, yeah, we'll get rid of them. All right, now I can retire. There are no more pieces of shit in esports. Oh, who's that? What the fuck? Uh, yeah. So that's my problem. I, I guess like the reason I'm so fucking jaded is like I I have mired myself in 20 years of bullshit. So it's to probably to be expected, but you know. By the way, though, I will say, low key, that is one of my favorite like pet peeves slash annoying things is when in a convo like this, they don't disagree with anything we've said, but the guy who is the new guy just rocks up like, Y'all are a bit negative, aren't you? Yeah, I know. Like, yeah. <laughs> what do you expect? Like, yeah. what we just went through? It's, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like talking to combat that, veterans. Yeah. Yeah. PTSD's a bit much. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you ain't seen what I've seen. Like, you know? <laughs> Meanwhile, that, that person, because of the way esports is going to be tra changed into us, it took us, like, a long time to get here. But there, because we had a lot of good years of it not being yeah, shit, yeah. you know, mm. and it being kind of fun and, like, grassroots. Now that the whole... The the whole structure is so like over sanitized and, and the soul has been drained out of it. Those people turn into us in like two years. By oh, the they're on now. the fast track. They're, the, they're like those salmon you put into the fucking tube that shoots over the dam. Like they're going right in, man. Like, yeah, it's like, it's like one, two years max. The, the, we sure. got at least a few years of optimism. They, yeah. they, they've got like three months. <laughs> yeah. As they learn, those people in the guard who are like, I love esports. I just moved to LA and yesterday and now I don't have a job. It's like, yep, like, you got way, yeah. even yeah, though look, crazy. Look, Speedrun, the esports speedrun. Yeah. <laughs> I obviously, as a human, I have some level of compassion for anyone who loses their job, but everyone needs to make a living. And obviously, a lot of these people had earnest intentions. I do agree, though, like that. It's when the people where it's like they, they only just got fucked for the first time in esports in 2023. And they're like, I moved Kate Kabulo to LA, and you won't believe this, but there's like nothing, and I've just lost everything. It's like. <laughs> First time? Are you fucking yeah, kidding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you kidding me, bro? There's a there's a sad story there, like in the CLG example, where like those employees were told on like a Wednesday that they were losing their jobs on a third on a Friday. And what really sucks is like the the people that suffer the most in that is that core middle group of of, of people that work yes. for a company and yeah. fucking love esports and love the. Like, I mean, and they I, just got I know some of those people, man. and I know yeah. I know some of those people uh, at CLG, and what I. What I'll say is they got taken care of quite well. So that's yes, not it's true, sucked. bro. Well, I, I, I that's not did. true. All right, I, I know, know them, them way did, more than you okay. do. I'm sorry. All like right, we, right, we gotta right. have a little heat on the show. Like, but but like, <laughs> let me tell you. I hope that George tells his fucking story. It's not my story to tell, so I won't tell it. I didn't. I didn't. Okay. I didn't tweet anything. The only thing I tweet. But bro, if that story comes out about like what happened to a lot of those people, you're right. By the way, I want to like I like like there are some people that walked out of there with severance with with, with some shit like that. Yes. But there 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 was a there's a particular circumstance. I'll, I'll just I'll write it to you guys. But like like um. It, it, it was it, it was bad. I hope that story gets told someday. It was really sad what happened to a lot of those people. I'm I'm, I'm sorry to hear it. that, but I I I I do know that you know a lot of the people were like treated okay. Me and me and George <laughs> been due a conversation for a long time anyway. I ain't talked to that motherfucker <laughs> in ages. So, you know. Well, well, we'll see. Um, all right, guys, do you have any parting thoughts on this as we we enter the the eye of the esports storm? Uh, look, I'll I'll just do mine super quick. It's like this is all like, I I, I guess this sounds a bit woke. Sorry, um, I I you know I, I'm in a super ultra privileged position, so I can sort of relish in the death of esports a bit because like, <laughs> you know, my community have sort of rallied around me and basically like they're putting me through college essentially. So uh, you know, I I can sort of sit and watch, and it's fascinating to see that there are no more lies to tell. There's no more bullshit. There's nowhere to hide. This is the Warren Buffett quote. The tide has gone out. We can now see who's been swimming naked the entire time. And I think it's fucking great. And it's long overdue. I, I, I the, the only thing that makes me even remotely sad is the group of people we're talking about, the young creatives that thought they were getting into a sustainable industry yeah, that was exactly. going to excite them. Yeah, they're, they're, ju they're just so well they're said. Just, yeah. yeah, they're just getting mm -hmm. ground up by 
by by you know the machine and all of the scum fucks that like made all these like ridiculous years worth of bad decisions are still killing it. They they're gonna fail yeah. upwards. They're gonna go to other industries. Like there's gonna be people like you remember how like all the NFL and NBA executives all come back. They're gonna go back out to the sports world and go look at all these super cool products I made in esports. They're gonna be fine. And that sucks that there is no justice. But at least they won't be in esports anymore. That's like mm. uh, see I am an optimist after all guys so um you know it, it, it's it, it it this all had to happen i wish it happened before we peaked i because there are a lot yeah. of people that got great memories great times wealth you know and, and experiences that should have been reserved for the ogs only the people that really had skin in the game and the people that really committed to this thing and it sucks that a bunch of tourists got those memories but at the end of the day i got those memories too so whatever um you know it's a shame we didn't drive them out earlier but this is a necessary cleansing yeah I'm only, I, I, I only, i've got a short thing i'll just do a couple of sentences okay. but I, 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 most of the episode is what i think so all i'll say is this i'm not super optimistic in the sense that i don't actually know people or ways that this is going to improve i'll just say this i actually think so much of this is such a waste of time though like the stupidest thing about the esports industry and I, and from my own experience in it i imagine it must be the same in every industry is it's like if you ever see people working in an office the joke is they're not working. They're just like alt tabbing into Reddit yeah. or someone's putting in 10% of their time or they wait till it's five o'clock or 4.50. They do those emails quickly before Friday. Oh, they won't be able to reply over the weekend. Essentially, that's what esports is as well. So the good news is this. You don't need all the people in the esports industry. Loads of these people are getting fired. I'm sorry. You thought it was a gig. You came in as a tourist. You thought it was your dream job. It isn't. It didn't work out and you're at the bottom of the rung. So there's nothing left for you. There's no fucking room at the inn. But the good news is this. In my opinion, one person who is dedicated, works on their skill set and craft, and has actual real passion can do the work of about 50 people who are just there for a gig or a paycheck. So you don't need that many people to get a lot of these companies' initiatives out of this mire. You could reformulate things in a, in a pared-down, streamlined way that makes sense. If you can actually do some of the things we talked about, break some of the IP rights, find out some of the margins, then you can do fairer deals in which actually does this make sense. Because one thing I've always thought is whack, and until this ever exists... I don't think you can ever have a high trust industry like people want. You have to have a, a world in which it's not just that, like, I can get you to do a deal with me where you're going to get ripped off. It's like, why would I want to do that, though? Why would I want the rep of ripping you off? We in esports haven't gotten to that point yet. Like, one of the things we were talking about earlier was they have tried to just fucking skin the sheep a hundred times in a row, and eventually there's nothing left. Like, you have to at least give them a fucking reach around in this and out. Like, what are you doing? Like, that's the maddest part. So at the end of it all, yeah, unsurprisingly, a million sponsors have been burned. Every fucking VC group in the world has had every idiot esports person begging on their doorstep, and you've burned a lot of the fucking bridges, a lot of the people that we needed to come in, a lot of the money, a lot of the revenue stream. But like I say, as long as it all goes away, all the bullshit. And that's the best thing. The best thing is this. It's only when things are corrupt that scammers and people like that flood a scene. Because what they do is they mimic what's legitimate and authentic. When there's nothing left for the scammers, they will leave and find a new scam. It'll be crypto or something else, Web3, whatever new angle it'll be. They'll go into that space. And the good thing is the ones of us that are left, as I say, if you get the right partnerships together... You don't even need that many people to make these. Like I said, there are team orgs that have a thousand employees. Well, team game devs, let's say, that have a thousand employees where like 80 people do the work. Like mm -hmm. you could absolutely change this whole industry tomorrow, in my opinion, if someone had the will and the way. I think the analogy that I'll make is, you know, it's like I, being in esports for this long, it's like being one of those tribes in in Brazil in the middle of the Amazon. And people, you know, people they they live isolated from everybody else. They don't want the all of the modern marvels. And people come up on them and try and disturb them for natural resources and whatever whatever else you have. And like, I just really want to live in with the the tribe of esports people. And I never wanted really all of this other fancy shit that came on. I grew up watching Brood War from OGN in this janky ass studio in a mall in Seoul, South Korea. And that was the first place I cast it. And I was over the moon to be casting there because it was small and it was fun and it had an intimate atmosphere to it. And it was built for people who are passionate about it. 
And then what happened is a bunch of fancy people got in there and decided to sell me a bunch of shit that I didn't want and that didn't really improve the quality of my life because they didn't understand my motivation. My motivation wasn't to exist in the modern world. It was to exist in a way of life that I appreciated. And so if we can go back to that, that would be cool. <laughs> Damn. Dad, you get the last word, brother. Oh God. Okay, that's a lot of pressure because I, I, I and for that reason, I don't think I'm gonna speak any more on the state of the industry because I just think that like I, I first of all, I'm like uh, not to jerk everybody off, but I, it's it, I really a true honor to be here. I've always looked up to you three as sort of the gods of esports. I didn't even know that you guys do this thing and, and, and like come together to talk about this because you guys have just had such a history. Um, even as a team owner, I haven't had the context because I haven't had the oversight that you guys have had. Monte Cristo has been like fucking. 10 things. So I, I think like what has been said about the industry here can be said as best as it can say. Um, I, I agree with Richard Lewis that I like recessions because it shows who's who. And I hope that I get to be excited again about spending ad budget and spending resources on esports because I do think that there is a lot of passion in competitive gaming. I think that everybody in this call started because they loved on differing levels in different sports the ability to give people opportunities to play competitive games because they chose to be fucking great at something. And I still think there's room for that in small pockets and places. And I encourage everybody to go try to find and support those pockets of those places. There's fucking cool shit going on still you still got artosis playing brood war like literally a, a, a man who has never been more angry at anything in his life but it's such a good stream, <laughs> stream like, it's, 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 like <laughs> that, it, it's such a good stream it's such a good stream like there is stuff out there right that like is still in the spirit of it you just have to look a little bit harder to find it and while like it, it, it like the it's 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 like I don't even think it's like a darkest before the dawn thing. I think we're just still going to get dark and darker. <laughs> and that's just going to be the way of things. But in that darkness, there will be some cool shit still coming up. Maybe tech solves a lot of things. Maybe we see some things that don't just get owned by huge publishers. And I'm excited to keep looking for that kind of stuff and just honored to be here. So thank you guys for um, choosing to bring me on here because seriously, oh, this is you're, awesome. You're a great guest, man, and you have great yeah. insight into this. So we appreciate it. And plus, you know, you, since you're not doing esports any longer so directly, you can speak a lot more openly and honestly about your experiences, which is very valuable. And, yeah. and I, I guess like the other side is really cool too because I can just, I get to see where the ad budget is being spent. And, and like a brand's like really talk to me about like what is happening in the space. And it, it's so interesting how their view has changed, right? Where like years ago, they were so excited about, hey, get me, I've been getting calls like, get me into esports, get me through the door. How do I get in, right? And then like, you, I'm now I'm pitching them and they're like, uh, yeah, I kind of heard this thing that was going on. Maybe I read a Richard Lewis sub stack and like, I, I, I saw something. I'm not too sure about this, buddy. I think we're going to put our ad budget over into PPC and I'm like, fuck, you know? So like, like Wait hopefully Wait till the that... Overwatch League dies, bro. Those calls <laughs> are going to be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just I hope this world kind of comes back where we can all be excited again in our own way. Yeah. Me too. But uh by the way, guys, we can't do questions today because it is insanely late for our Europeans. Uh, That's my so fault. Sorry. sorry. I wake up. I watched John Wick until 3 a.m. last night. So <laughs> I mean, it, I've been super sick lately, so my sleep yeah. pattern's actually yeah. shredded. Yeah. This worked out yeah. fine. <laughs> so Richard's also been ill. So um, sorry about that, guys. But as usual, thank you very much for watching. And esports, Delinda Est.